to today's webinar, we would now like to get into the position for the national anthem. morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Alison Mahada, Cooperative Officer, who would be your Masters of Ceremonies for this morning session. And I would like to welcome you all to this virtual webinar, which is being hosted by the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service in collaboration with the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. I would now like to acknowledge the Honorable Foster Cummings, Minister of Youth Development and National Service, Mr. Farouk Hussein, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service, Dr. Andre Vincent Henry, the Director of the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies, Ms. Sharmin McMillan, Acting Commissioner for Cooperative Development in the Cooperative Development Division. Distinguished panelists, Mr. Mariano Brown, the Chief Executive Officer, UWI, Arta Lockjack. Recording in progress. Global School, Global School of Business, Ms. Candice Matthews, Member Relations and Communication Specialist at the Leading Edge Credit Union in Canada. Mr. Nigel Matthews, Managing Director of NEM Leadership Consultants. Specially invited guests, cooperators, members of the viewing public on Zoom and YouTube. This webinar is in commemoration of International Credit Union Day, which is celebrated on the third Tuesday of October since 1948. Yes, you heard that date correct. It's 1948. And that is where in October, we commemorate International Credit Union Month. This occasion celebrates the passion and the spirit of the global credit union movement, the greatest movement in the world. That is why each person has a unique opportunity to change people's lives. This year's International Credit Union team is building financial health for a brighter tomorrow, which is most applicable in today's current times. We have a very power packed program this morning and I will be tag teaming with Mr. Colin Bartholomew Senior Lecturer at the Cipriani Labor College. Our presenters will transform your mind as to the 
current theme of building a financial health for a brighter tomorrow. I would now like to introduce the director of the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies, Dr. Andre Vincent Henry. Put your hands together for Mr. Henry. Good morning and thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to associate myself with your, um, your protocol listing, but permit me to single out the Honorable Foster Cummins, Minister of Youth Development and National Service. I want to welcome everyone to the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies virtual space. And I want to offer a special welcome to the Honorable Minister, a distinguished alumnus of the college. I want to welcome him back to his alma mater. And Minister, I hope to get the opportunity to welcome you physically to the college and to be able to share with you how the college may contribute to the important and urgent work of transforming the cooperative movement to ensure that it is able to fulfill its historic mission. Indeed, it was the foresight of our first prime minister and father of our nation, Dr. the Right Honorable Eric Eustace Williams, that continues to drive our mission here at the college. In the lead up to independence, Dr. Williams engaged in a series of listening tours and consultations with various groups in society. He was convinced that every citizen of Trinidad and Tobago had a right and I might add an obligation to contribute to the development of the soon to be independent state of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Williams coined the concept of the people's sector. In this, he was particularly interested in ensuring that there was equity and social justice and that all persons, including those who had traditionally been dispossessed, disadvantaged, marginalized and vulnerable, would have an opportunity to contribute to their country and to benefit from its development. As an educator and historian, Dr. Williams understood the importance of training and capacity development. He was of the view that if the country invested in its human talent, then the returns would be exponential. 60 years on, we are dealing with some of the same issues, even though in radically different manifestations. The crux of the matter remains. How do we adjust to a changing environment and now changing at unprecedented speed that would allow the fundamentals of equity and social justice to prevail in the face of unprecedented challenges? This is certainly the driver of our work here at Cipriani to be true to, be the, to the vision of Williams, which transcends the last 60 years. The phase two of the, of the roadmap to recovery, which was developed through extensive consultations in response to COVID-19 has three pillars. One, diversifying and transforming the economy of Trinidad and Tobago through leveraging digitalization. Two, making food security a reality in Trinidad and Tobago. And three, leaving no one behind while creating greater equity. I see a dynamic and important role for the cooperative movement and by extension, the credit union movement as a mobilizer of community assets. And the college is con committed to contributing to this process. In closing, I wish to acknowledge the sterling work of the Cooperative Development Division of the Ministry of Youth and National Service and the division for its willingness to partner with the college. In this regard, I want to thank especially the Commissioner for Cooperative Development, uh, Ms. Charmaine Macmillan and her staff. And I want to also thank especially Mrs. Andrea Makano Quillen who sits on our board of governors here at the college and demonstrates an exceptional dedication and competence in her craft. I also want to acknowledge 
my colleagues, the Deputy Director for Academic Affairs, Mr. Sheldon Salino, whose passion for cooperative development sometimes competes with his obligations to oversee the full academic program of the institution. But I guess once bitten by the cooperator's bug, it never leaves you. So I'm prepared to forgive Sheldon for that. Sheldon's comrade in arms and successor as head of department of cooperative studies is the very competent and talented Colin Bartholomew, and he is well placed to guide our work. I am honored to be part of their team, of their team. Ladies and gentlemen, I know that we will have an exceptional interaction today. I thank you for being with us, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Andre Vincent Henry. And I too can attest to have been bitten by that cooperative bug. And Cipriani Labor College is my alma mater. And I'm a proud student of Cipriani Labor College. <laughs> Thank you so much for your words of wisdom. I would now like to introduce the feature address by the Honorable Minister Foster Cummings in the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service. Put your hands together for the Honorable Minister. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Let me say to Dr. Vincent Henry that I thoroughly enjoyed my time at Cyprian Labor College and uh, that the work of course, we'll continue to get the fullest support of the government as we continue to encourage cooperators throughout Trinidad today. Today, this morning, we meet in commemoration of International Credit Union Day and your theme, Building Financial Health for a Brighter Tomorrow, indeed falls in line with the recommendations of the Roadmap Committee as spoken of by Dr. Henry. I want to acknowledge the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service, Mr. Farouk Hussein, the Commissioner for Cooperative Development, Ms. Sharmin McMillan, our distinguished panelists, Mr. Mariano Brown, CEO of the UE Atalokja Global School of Business, Ms. Candice Matthews, the Member Relations and Communication Specialist, Leading Edge Credit Union of Canada. Mr. Nigel Matthew, Managing Director, NEM Leadership Consultants, all our specially invited guests and members of the viewing public. I'm delighted to address you this morning at this webinar as we engage in what promises to be an edifying and enlightening discussion geared towards empowering your members so that can stabilize their financial position during this post-pandemic period. This webinar is also being held to commemorate a very significant day in our calendar of observances at the MyDNS. And I dare say one of the more significant observances for the credit union sector, International Credit Union Day, which is tomorrow, October 21st reminds me so much of my time as a corporate development officer at the then Ministry of Labor and Corporate. And we have the executive and staff at the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service. I extend best wishes to you and all 660,000 plus credit union members across Trinidad and Tobago for a happy International Credit Union Day 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, each year, International Credit Union Day is commemorated to increase the awareness of the tremendous work that credit unions and other financial cooperatives are doing around the world, and to give their members the opportunity to become more informed and empowered. This year, International Credit Union Day seeks to highlight how credit unions are working to improve the financial well-being of their members under the theme, Building Financial Health 
for a brighter tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, the Corporate Development Division within the, the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service has an integral role in making this a reality. The CDD promotes cooperatives as viable business enterprises by ensuring safety, security, professionalism, and fair play for all, and by creating an enabling environment in which their 300 plus registered cooperatives contribute towards the socioeconomic development of a combined membership of 660,000. At the MyDNS, we recognize that a significant number of the membership within, is within the mature sector of our society. But we understand the importance of sustainable economic options for young people, particularly as we continue to devise a roadmap post COVID-19. Therefore, as Minister of Youth Development, it would be prudent for me to mention, or rather emphasize that the future of the credit union movement lies within our youth population. Let us face it, the integration of youth in all types of cooperative business can reinvigorate this movement with a focus on rebuilding our urban and rural communities. I must commend the Cooperative De Development Division for their willingness to embrace the involvement of our youth even before the pandemic. They continue to promote youth participation within the sector and encourage entrepreneurial activities through the junior cooperative societies which target young persons 21 years and under. The Cooperative Development Division in 2015 collaborated with the Junior Achievers of Trinidad and Tobago to launch the Junior Cooperative Enterprise Program, JSEP, a model that has worked in bringing cooperatives closer to the youth. This program has a strategic objective to promote entrepreneurship within the secondary school environment by equipping young people with the requisite tools that empower them to become successful entrepreneurs. Since the inception of this program, approximately 30 schools have participated, with 60% of them being registered as junior cooperative societies in accordance with the Cooperative Societies Act, Chapter 8103. The division has also implemented an ICT system for junior cooperative societies in Trinidad and Tobago to lessen the onerous tasks of manually recording transaction in all, transactions in all their books of accounts and to allow the CCD to execute its regulatory and supervisory functions more effectively and efficiently. That, ladies and gentlemen, is our commitment to the youth and to the sustainability of the cooperative movement. I think it's safe to say that many of our young entrepreneurs are graduates of the JSEP program, in which they would have been enlightened to assume leadership roles across various sectors, shifting their mindset from employee to employer, and increasing their capacity as co-creators of our sustainable futures. As a leader in the cooperative sector, the Cooperative Development Division continues to encourage credit unions to apply some of their strategies to junior cooperative activities. These include providing bursaries and scholarships, establishing youth groups and youth leagues, sponsoring projects aimed at youth development, including schools and credit union operations. Such undertakings work singularly and collaboratively, collaboratively to educate young entrepreneurs and increase the financial literacy of our youth. The division continues their institutional strengthening to provide the requisite professional expertise and support to better serve members. They create avenues to enhance the financial capability of credit union members, which allow them to effectively manage their funds. Ladies and gentlemen, the Cooperative Development Division is distinguished for their dedication and commitment to enhancing the knowledge of the current and anticipated membership. Today's webinar is one such approach that demonstrates their commitment. Today, distinguished field experts will share their perspectives and provide you with strategic measures to enhance your financial health for a brighter tomorrow. I implore you to maximize this advantageous opportunity. As an individual, use this as a start to refocus your financial outlook. And as a credit union practitioner, utilize the knowledge to sharpen your skills to better serve your clientele. I wish to congratulate Ms. Sharmin Macmillan Simon, Commissioner for Cooperative Development, and Dr. Andrew Vincent Henry, 
Director, Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies, along with their dedicated staff for collaboratively planning and successfully executing this initiative in commemoration of International Credit Union Day 2021. I applaud your efforts and encourage you to continue to take the requisite innovative strides to enhance the capacity and consciousness of the cooperative and credit union sectors. I trust that today's webinar will bring enlightenment to each of you and your organization. As I close, let me remind you that the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service remains committed to the advancement of the credit union sector and the cooperative movement across Trinidad and Tobago. And let me say to Dr. Vincent Henry, that I will certainly be most pleased to visit Cyprian Labor College, College of uh, Cooperative Studies and Labor as soon as you can reach it. I want to thank you all for your attention. May God bless each and every one of you and do have a blessed day. I do want to apologize for having to leave abruptly, but of course this morning uh, is cabinet and I will have, of course, matters of state to attend. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister Foster Cummings, for imparting the words of dedication, commitment, the words of development of the youth. And that is something we at the Cooperative Development Division is focusing on succession planning and the development of the youth in Trinidad and Tobago. I would now like to hand you all over to my team, my partner, my tag team partner, who will be handling the next part of this webinar. He is no stranger to us here. He's a proud father, a gentleman whom I have had the pleasure of working with an educator whose vision is to empower students to become cooperative ambassadors for Trinidad and Tobago. Put your hands together to welcome Mr. Colin Bartholomew, Senior Lecturer at the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies and Head of the Department for Cooperative Studies. Welcome to the podium. Thank you, Master of Ceremonies, Alison Manula. And while the virtual applause um, slowly comes to an end, uh, let me acknowledge Honorable Foster Cummins, Minister of Youth Development and National Service, Mr. Farouk Hussain, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service. I must also acknowledge my director, Dr. Andre Vincent Henry, director at Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies and Acting Commissioner for Cooperative Development, Ms. Charmaine McMillan, other specially invited guests, fellow cooperators, this distinguished panel and speakers. We have a, a, a very cosmopolitan uh, group here this morning coming to present and uh, fellow cooperators. Let me begin uh, and keeping in the spirit of the occasion by wishing each and every one a happy International Credit Union Day in advance. And I'm doing this in International Credit Union Week and this occasion really commemorates. It enables us uh, to begin the celebration. It's a good run up into what we'll be doing, you know, for the rest of the month, but in particular, on International Credit Union Day, as you articulated, being celebrated on the 21st of October, 2021, which is tomorrow, all right? So as we warm up and we get into that, this portion of, the, of today's agenda will actually get into some very interesting, enlightening presentation surrounding the theme for this year, which is building financial health for a brighter tomorrow. And it's such an applicable theme for the time in which we exist, as well as in preparation for what many, many quarters are referring to as the new normal. And I love to refer to it as the new cooperative normal, the NCN. So this morning, we have three presenters. 
Mr. Mariano Brown, Miss Candice Matthews, and Mr. Nigel Matthew. And I let me begin by thanking them for accepting the invitation to add substance, quality, and really some perspective to, to this webinar as we move forward. Now, as we get into this session, I'd like to encourage those of you on the various platforms to just utilize the chat area to share any comments, any questions you may have for the presenters. And uh, we will entertain it and facilitate their response as much as possible. First up, we have Mr. Mariano Brongno. Each presenter will be delivering a 30 to 35 minute presentation. And we will also be facilitating questions and answers. Now, Mr. Brown, he has really given us, as with all the presenters, a part of their schedule this morning. So he will be delivering this morning in the first position. Now, he's currently the Chief Executive Officer at the UWI, UWI, Arthur Lobjack Global School of Business. And he's also the managing partner of Brown & Company, which provides financial management and advisory services, and the executive chairman of a leader, Management Services Limited. We would all know him as a former member of the cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago, in which he held two portfolios simultaneously, one as the Minister of Trade and Industry and the Minister in the Ministry of Finance. As Minister, he was Chairman of the Organizing Committee for the Fifth Summit of the Americas and the Commonwealth Heads of Government Conferences held in 2009. Now, prior to his appointment as Minister, he spent most of his time in the financial services sector in the region. Immediately before assuming office, he was managing director of the Butterfield Bank for four years and CEO of the Caribbean Commercial Bank for 11 years, both institutions in Barbados. He has also held several management positions in Republic Bank and was a founding principal of an investment bank in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, Mr. Brown, writes regularly on matters of banking and finance in the region and has presented several papers at international conferences. You would also know him as a radio host on the radio program, the I-95 Mandate, which deals with issues of development. He, he has read for an undergraduate degree in economics from UWI St. Augustine and an MBA at the Manchester Business School. Mr. Brown is a chartered accountant by profession and is a former vice president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Trinidad and Tobago and treasurer of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of the Caribbean. That is a real rich introduction. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Mr. Mariano Brown to the podium to deliver his presentation this morning. Mr. Brown, the floor is yours. Good morning. Good morning to all the participants. Um, thank you for that <laughs> long introduction. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, my, my, my compliments and my, my thanks also for the, for the minister for hosting it. Thank you very much to the um, permanent secretary and the acting commissioner as well for their presence. Um, thank you also for the participants, for your attention and for your presence. And good morning also to my friend, <coughs> Mr. And Dr. Andrew Vincent Henry. I think our children were at school together and we have a little association from a professional perspective as well. Um, this morning, I'd just like to focus, I just, uh, and given the, 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 the approach by Mr. Bartholomew and the, the day, I thought I'd just like to just run through some, some quick little um, date, pieces of data and ask some questions as this thing from give any sort of, um, if you want major insights into exactly where we are or not. Um, congratulations also to the credit union movement um, and, and celebration of World Credit Union Day. Uh, the credit union movement in, in Trinidad also has a, a, a rich history 
um, having been introduced as a, as a vehicle for social transformation as well as economic transformation by, of all people, the Catholic Church, <laughs> the, Jesuit, the Jesuits, as a way of responding to what was at the time a labor crisis, uh, a crisis of unemployment um, in, the, in the period in the 1930s. Uh, and given the fact that the, the, the country was underbanked, the region was underbanked, uh, and that financial services were not generally available to certain sections of the community. This was a way of um, creating an intermediation capacity for the, for, for, for the under, for, one would say the under, underrepresented, underprivileged, um, given the time in which it has been, in which it was created. So that one has to look at it with, with that particular uh, background. The issue, however, is that since independence, we've grown up a bit. Um, so that they, we have to look at it also from the perspective in terms of what are the developmental opportunities moving forward and what do we have to approach it and what do we have to do moving forward. So I've, I just took some information, um, some quick information. It's not longitudinal. In other words, it's, short, it's a very short spectrum, which is the data that was available to me on the basis of, of, of a limited notice. And I must thank Mr. Bartholomew for, for assisting me in that regard. I, I use the, um, <clears throat> the World Council analysis of uh, well, the credit union movement in the different regions and paid a little attention to some sectors in the, in the, in the Caribbean region in terms of where we're positioned and where we're heading. So if I could just share with you, so we have just about eight slides, um, six are, well, two are really introductions, um, five are data, uh, two are, and two are uh, uh, questions, conclusions, um, in terms of where we go. The purpose of, of the slides is to provoke deliberately. Um, hopefully they will have some people in, 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 in the room and in the meeting who would um, be, be willing to be challenged in, in, in terms of a perspective, in terms of what is required moving forward. I think the, the, the perspective that I'm coming from is very simply that we are, I mean, we call it an age of disruption, that's for sure. Um, certainly in terms of the challenges which we face at multiple levels, right? but the reality is that at every level, nothing saves, stays the same. So that we, we, are, we always have to be focused in terms of where we are in the process of transition. It's a process. And by definition, the, the world in which we live is not going to remain the same. And that the positions which we undertook or the businesses which we have developed now have to be moved to face the realities of the future. And that one must also, the, the future is in the present. What we do today matters because it, it sets the tone for where we are going to go. And the difference between where we are going and where we are is based upon management decisions. So at every stage, um, the, the purpose of the presentation is to recognize the primacy of two critical factors in the business of, of running any organization. The first is leadership and the second is management. And by definition, leadership and management takes place in a context. And the context is that it must have some vision of the future, a position in terms of where it wants to compete, the space in which it wants to compete, and also what it wants to achieve in that competitive space. Now, having said that, the, the, the credit union movement has done a lot in terms of what it, where it has taken to get to this particular point in time. But we stand on the cusp, not of a precipice, but of a jumping off point in terms of what do we do to address the changes that are clearly going to come and the changes in lifestyle, as well as the changes in terms of economic circumstances of the different regions in which we live. So without much further ado, I'll just um, if I could just basically use, share the screen and bring up some of my slides. All right. Okay. Sorry, it's not in presentation view, so just let me adjust that. All right, not getting where I want. Um, the, the, the bottom line uh, is that when we look at the world numbers, in terms of what the numbers are, right? This is what the world's the statistical chapter comes from 2020. 
It shows how many credit unions there are in the world, the number of members, cover continents, how many countries, and the percentage penetration rate. And the percentage penetration rate is an average for the world, but it's, one would say at 12.8%, one would say, um, looking at the big picture, that's a substantial number. It's not small by any stretch of imagination. 12% of the world's financial assets uh, is, is large. 12% of the percentage in terms of the population as penetration rate. And the penetration rate is calculated as the number of people who fall within that age grouping 15 to 64, which is what we consider to be the active economic age. Of course, there are some changes in that because we are getting older and we are staying and we are working for longer. So that may necessarily have to stretch a little bit. But let's just say for the, for the definition and purposes, that's what we're looking at. Right. <clears throat> and this is, unfortunately, doesn't come up so well on the screen. Um, what we have here, this represents um, differences in countries. This is the penetration of the uh, credit union movement as a percentage of population in the Caribbean. It's high 60s as compared to a North, the, the North American region in which is in just under 50% uh, as compared to Latin America, which is under 20, or averaging around 15. Um, Africa and Asia are much smaller and much smaller percentages, and so is the ocean Asia, very small percentages. So we can say that in certainly in the Western part of the hemisphere, the penetration rate is much stronger than it is in Europe, than it is in Asia and or Africa. What does that mean in terms of the Caribbean's penetration rate? Well, <clears throat> well, this is Trinidad compared to the, I've moved a little too quick. Let's just move back a little bit. Um, three, and my fourth slide seems to have disappeared. So let's deal with this. Just comparing how Trinidad and Tobago compares to the rest of the Caribbean. Or well, the penetration rate in, Trin in, <clears throat> in Trinidad and Tobago um, is somewhere in the region of 70%. Um, in the rest of the Caribbean, we have all different kinds of rates. Barbados is 115%. In the in in Dominica, it's 160. In Montserrat, it's 150. Um, so we have regions in which the credit union movement is substantial. Um, so Barbados, Dominica, I think uh, Antigua for sure. We have very high penetration rates, but relative to the average, when that is high at 70 percent, relative to the region's average of 60 percent. So that means. We have a number of people who know about the credit unions who are actually involved in the credit union. What, therefore, is the position relative to the assets? What is the average assets? How does it look? How does it stack up? Right. <clears throat> well, these numbers are all coming from the World Credit Union, the US dollar assets. Now, what I'm looking at here is the number of credit unions on the left hand side, which looks at the total number of credit unions by country. Um, in the case of Trinidad and Tobago, Trinidad and Tobago has 127 credit unions, uh, whereas uh, Barbados has 33, which is in blue, and Jamaica has 25. The total volume of assets which is held um, by the credit union movement or owned falls under the control of the credit union movement amounts to just under $3 billion in the case of Trinidad and Tobago using the World Credit Council of Credit Unions numbers. Uh, it accounts for 1.3 million in the case of Barbados. So the average number or the average size of the credit union movement relative per head of population is much higher in Barbados than it is in Trinidad, which means that their penetration rate is not only, not, not only stronger, but also the position of the credit union movement relative to the disposition of assets in Barbados is, is, is relatively strong. Um, <clears throat> and in the case of Jamaica, it's just under a billion dollars. Uh, now, this is for the three years, 2018, 19, and 2020. Um, we don't have data for 2021, of course, because it's not completed. And a good comparison would really show a, a 10 year, 20 year study to determine what are the relative changes which are taking place. So show whether the, the, the system is growing, whether the credit union is growing as a percentage market share and so on. But what one is interested in is the trends. What I'm trying to do here is just simply to take a snapshot and look at the relative, uh, if you want, importance of the credit union movement in different countries. Now, there's some difficulty with some of the data. Um, Jamaica tracks its, its, its credit unions uh, very well, and they update the data regularly. 
Um, the World Council of Credit Unions data for 2020 contains an error in Barbados. Somebody forgot to divide by two. So the figure shows up as, as a doubling of the number. So I, I had to go, I went back to Barbados numbers and checked. Um, well, dividing by two kind of roughly gives you, it's not too far off. So it's a good approximation. Um, however, um, looking at the financial stability reports, the financial stability reports of Barbados is very clear because it measures the position of the credit union movement relative to the portfolio of financial assets which are held through the various areas, through uh, from the point of view relative assets which are under administration by uh, insurance companies, pension funds, um, and relative to the overall financial health of the financial system. So they gave a pretty clear idea very, very quickly when you go to the financial stability report. The financial stability report for Jamaica and Barbados, so and for Jamaica and Trinidad, does not give those numbers. Right? It gives relative numbers in terms of what's taking place within the sector rather than giving an absolute percentage. So you have to do a little bit of working back. I was able to do that in the case of Trinidad, but not able to do it in the case of Jamaica because the numbers weren't aggregated in a fashion which allows, allows for that. And I say all of that just simply to introduce the next slide, which really looks at the share of the financial system. Now, what my calculations for Jamaica says that it says that the number falls is less than 10%, but somewhere between five and seven. But I didn't get precise numbers, so I didn't really want to put it up. However, in the case of the Trinidad Tobago numbers, as well as the, uh, <clears throat> the Barbados numbers, the share has been over time somewhere between 10 and 11%, right? Looking at it 10 um, from 2018, 2019, even go back, the figure means that the from what I remember, the numbers suggest that the financial share or the share of financial services in the Trinidad and Tobago market has shown some growth. I'm not clear how much growth, so and I didn't do the type of work to, to allow me to make some conclusions on that, but I'll leave it at that. It forms approximately 10% of the financial system. Now that's pretty strong, pretty robust. Uh, in, in fact, the numbers, the numbers given by the, 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 the central bank for under um, table F12 in the national financial system or in, in the analysis of the financial system gives the same number for 2018, for 2018, 2019, and 2020. Right. So it's at variance with the numbers which are reported in the World Council of Credit Union. I have simply kept that number. It looks like an estimate. Um, the estimate is about $16 billion, uh, sorry, $17 billion, a you know, billion dollars difference but it puts the rough number at somewhere in the region of about 11 to 12% of the financial assets in the system. So let's just say, let's go with the average of 11. In the case of Barbados, the, the average is about 10 uh, over time. <clears throat> now that says, I mean, that the difference of 1% between the two countries is, is, not, is not too much, right? So they have not much to say about it. Just to say that the financial system is very well penetrated from that perspective. However, when you look at it from the point of view in terms of the numbers of people who are part of the credit union movement in both countries, you have to ask yourself the question, what is taking place in that regard? In the case of Barbados, there are literally, uh, the, 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 as a percentage share, there are about 115% of the total, pop, total working population, which means that you have double and triple memberships in different credit unions. In the case of Trinidad and Tobago, the penetration rate is low at 72%. But it means that a substantial portion of the population are members of the credit union movement. So then one would have to ask the question, why does the credit union movement only have 10% of the assets of the system? Why would they hold um, the obverse position that a substantial portion of the assets of individuals are within the banking sector or within other financial institutions? And the question immediately comes to the fore, what is the credit union movement not doing? Those are some of the considerations. So when we talk about, when we get to the issue from the point of view of competition and innovation and financial health, there's some questions that, that, that we want, one has to ask, some considerations that one takes into position. Generally speaking, smaller organizations, and we presume that the credit union movements are smaller than the banks. There are 127 credit unions. There are approximately what, five banks. Right. Um, Royal Republic, um, uh, First Caribbean, um, FCB, um, City, 
right? We have approximately five, but the Bank of Nova Scotia, six. So we have six, bank, six banks. And of course, they dominate. They, between themselves, they, owe, they have more than 75, more than 75, about 80% of the total assets of the banking, of the, of the entire financial system. Now that's substantial, right? When you compare it to the credit union movement, which has a market penetration rate, in terms of numbers of individuals of 72%, but only 10% of the assets. So clearly, uh, people are making and making a statement with regard to where they hold the majority of the wealth. The wealth is being saved, not in the credit union movement, but it's being saved elsewhere. Now, if smaller organizations are meant to be agile, and that's where competitive innovation is meant to be coming from, then one has to ask the question, what is taking place in the credit union movement from that perspective? Right? How is the credit union movement supposed to move itself away from the traditional perspective as being a sort of an alternative depository for what one would consider to be personal needs or personal uses uh, into a key financial player in the, in the life cycle of financial planning for an individual? And are the, the credit unions adopting and moving in that particular area? The question would be, what is preventing them? Because that requires some degree of innovation, that requires some degree in terms of, of, of changes in terms of the product mix. And if the product mix is just simply about loans and shareholder loans and so on, then by definition, uh, it's not going to meet the changing demands of the system of what people really need. So that the credit union movement will always be playing second fiddle, smaller role. And as intimated in the conversation of the, uh, in, in, in the opening remarks by the minister, um, it has an aging portfolio. In other words, the members are getting older. And of course, growth is also as of a demographic variable. Um, are we catering to the needs of the younger population? What does the younger population need? What do they want from the point of view of financial services? So the, 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 the proposition is generally a general proposition, if you want a general hypothesis, if you put it forward in, in, to use some more scientific language, is that the, the, the penetration rate by numbers of, of, by per head of population is, is out of sync with the assets which are held by the credit union movement. One, one also has to point to, um, you would have to say that in the case of Barbados, with 33 credit unions for 270,000 people, they probably have too many credit unions. Um, the, the same argument will be made with regard to Trinidad, where we have 127. And that 127 has a, a, a wide range of differentiation. We have probably about six credit unions that account for 80% um, of the assets, right? And those would be the larger credit unions. One would then have to ask, is there a difference in terms of performance? Is there a difference in terms of objective? Where do they operate? And are the larger credit unions, are they innovative? Are they making the changes? And what are the implications for the smaller credit, credit unions uh, as we move forward? Uh, financial competition is really about, how shall we call it? The law of large numbers. The larger you are, the better your ability to survive in the market and the better your ability to provide services at a cheaper cost. So by having many credit unions, it means that the average cost of providing the services is probably a little, ex much more expensive than it ought to be and probably more expensive than it is relative to what is being done by the commercial banking center. So there are some issues there in terms of relativities, there are issues of efficiency, and there are issues in terms of product, product delivery. Are the credit unions in Trinidad and Tobago doing what they are supposed to do in terms of the delivery of financial services? Are they agile and are they innovative? I just simply ask the question, you will have to make the presumption. I have my own point of view, but I don't necessarily want to put that on the table at this stage. If, if I'm challenged, I will tell you where my head is at. Um, <clears throat> so the, the large number of credit unions indicates a relative disparity. If we were to compare the product offerings of our credit unions in Trinidad and Tobago, the, credit, the, the product offerings of the credit union movement, for example, in Barbados, we'd find a wide, or wide disparity in terms of the financial products. You would find that debit cards and credit cards are very much the norm in terms of the credit, in terms of the credit union movement uh, in Barbados. And that raises some issues because the future, when we talk about FinTech, and that's, that's one of the critical issues moving forward, the fact that we are really talking about the integration of financial technology 
and financial technology is integrated with um, the business of financial services. That becomes a very innovative area moving forward and a, an area in which there is going to be great competition. It does not necessarily mean the banks will win. It does not necessarily mean that the next large financial services firm is going to be what we call a bank. In fact, the language uh, that is used in, in the textbook uh, or textbook language, for example, um, Sinki, for example, on, on bank financial management, he no longer distinguishes between banks, insurance companies, and what we call traditionally in the business non-banks. He calls them financial services firms, uh, financial services firms. That's an important distinction because it really says it doesn't matter um, what you call yourself, it matters what you do and how you get to the public. Now, when one puts that in perspective, that raises some issues in terms, some of the real questions moving forward for the credit union movement. Right? Are we doing the right things? Is the credit union movement addressing the issues of FinTech? Is it addressing the issues of change uh, in financial services delivery in terms of the product orientation that, that is required? I think we would have all seen, especially over the last year, the substantial change which has been required literally in terms of the way the world does things and acceleration of that process. Certainly in terms of online delivery of services, in terms of electronic transactions. Now, if that is going to be the key moving forward, then it is difficult to see how the credit union movement one will survive in the first instance, or two, grow, if it does not change the technology base and the platform on which it now operates. Now, that is not necessarily a dead end. In fact, there may be lots of opportunities in that because one of the, one of the things that we have learned, um, and it's generally coming to pass, is that small could be beautiful. In that, you can do the same, the, the internet gives you the capacity to have the same size footprint electronically. Right? But the requirement is, how do you stack up in a back office? It requires operational capacity and electronic capacity. There are several different ways to skin a cat, but literally the way of innovation suggests that's a direction in which the, the, the credit union movement must go. So <clears throat> the second part of that question is not only are, if they're doing the right things, but are, is the credit union movement doing the things right? In other words, is one thing to determine the direction. It's also in question about how you're going to do it. Have they determined the methodology and have they taken some of those changes on board? And the other aspect that follows immediately from the question of methodology, is there a need for some sort of, do we need cooperation or consolidation in the sector? That's another, that's a, that's a critical issue moving forward. And do the oversight and regulatory mechanisms that exist facilitate that development? Why we, we, about consolidation? Well, if you have a multiple of credit unions with a multiple of boards, with a multiple of um, credit committees and a multiple of managements, what we are doing is that we're increasing the average cost for delivery. Uh, and, and, and what the law of large numbers says is that the more customers, the, 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 the more customers you have service on a single platform says the service is likely to be cheaper once you're all other things being equal and once you're sufficiently efficient. So that there are, how shall we put it? There's some, there some transitional questions that the credit union movement has to face how we do things, how we manage it, and what is the platform that we're going to use to deliver new services and products and financial products of the future. And are we geared and is, are we doing, and are we in the process of becoming that more efficient financial institution? The, the key thing that we're learning is that literally almost everybody has access to a telephone and that the next financial services firm is as far away as your telephone. So is the credit union movement preparing to transition so that we become sufficiently flexible in terms of our product delivery, that we can actually service our portfolio and grow our portfolio using what will be the new methodologies which are becoming available electronically? And what are the implications for how the credit union movement is organized. How is it going to operate it? Are we going to stay as we are with 127 credit unions? Are we going to do, in, in the case of Jamaica, um, the, the, the situation was reasonably clear. 
Um, they were forced to consolidate, literally because of the trying financial times in which they found themselves. And they moved from 200 credit, 200 and odd credit unions down to 35 in the first instance and now down to 25. So the process of consolidation has been forced on by the objective economic facts. In the case of Trinidad and Tobago, well, we've had time. We've had time to adjust our business. We've had time to look at the scenario. The real issue is what are the decisions we're going to make to move the credit union forward, to make it innovative, and to make it to respond and make it respond to the financial needs of its membership. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown, for that very rich presentation. And a DSC provocative as well. I think you have been a protagonist here <laughs> at this session in terms of you know bringing certain key questions to light. And I mean, even in the comments, we have one on, 134 persons online now, and a lot of people really looking at it from the perspective. First of all, commenting you on on the facts and the street talk that you have brought to a forum like this. And then secondly, in terms of asking a couple of questions, and I know your time is limited with us this morning. So let me ask a question. You, you positioned the elements of leadership and management in, in terms of, in terms of um, a necessary requirement for the movement to, to develop into the, the spaces that it should. So at the beginning, I spoke about the new cooperative normal, and you touched on a number of points from the fintech to, to um, matching penetration with the shares and the finances. How, I'm shaping this question carefully, what are some of the key requirements you see for the future cooperative leaders in this new innovative space that have to exist in? Well, the, the function of leadership always is, is, is timing, tone, and tempo. Timing, tone, and tempo. Um, timing, when is the right time? How do you carry people along? How do you get people to see a vision? Um, vision is a difficult thing for, for many people to, 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 to buy into. And if you've been accustomed to doing it the traditional way, then moving it from point A to B um, requires a sort of transitional phase uh, and a transitional leadership. How do I get to move from here? How do I get my, how do I get them to step up? Um, and how do I get people to follow and to buy into the proposition? The second part of leadership is understanding uh, your role. Now, one of the difficulties with having 127 credit unions is that you have 127 general managers, you have 127 boards, right? And supervisory committees. So that's a, that's a wealth of different, that's a, a plethora of different views. And generally speaking, one of the biggest issues in, in that regard is that people tend to see, where am I going to be in all of this? Um, they don't necessarily see themselves as growing the movement. That is where am I going to grow with the movement? So that, that raises some other issues in terms of the, the wider perspective in terms of focusing on the, the ultimately, how do you improve the financial health of the individual member and of the credit union as a whole? What, what are the things that we need to do to get there? And how do I fit myself into that? I may not necessarily have a, a long-term role to play. And that is, one of the, that is another issue from a human and individual perspective that consolidation also means that um, my role becomes, uh, how shall we call it? Become, I, I become less important as being a player in a routine moving forward. So leadership is important from that perspective in terms of understanding where you fit in and what you need to do to move the organization forward. Most of us don't necessarily think about it from that perspective. Um, timing, tone, and tempo. Um, the tone and tempo is the speed at which we're going to have to operate. Um, the speed at which some of those decisions are going to make. And generally speaking, the, the credit union movement has not been known for um, operating with speed. Um, it's been known to be resistant to changes, particularly changes in regulation, <laughs> um, in terms of understanding that 
the, the changes in the regulation also, not only the regulation, the objective market conditions required. There's nothing that says that a credit union cannot fail. There's nothing that says that, uh, that, that credit unions won't make bad, won't make mistakes. And that small credit, uh, that, that a big organization could make a mistake and survive, but a small organization cannot make a big mistake. And there are several issues in some of the credit unions where some of those mistakes have been made. So that you have to, you have to get past that in terms of getting the, getting the entire credit union movement. And you may not be able to get all, but you may be able to get some to understand that there are, um, there's a necessary purpose in terms of financial strength and financial health. I right? know that's a, that's a human problem in terms of how that gets through. And that's why leadership becomes important. Being able to see the problem bigger than yourself. And right? you have to perhaps drop out of the equation. So that's a key thing. That's, that, that's, where, that's where the leadership perhaps is the biggest issue. And of course, it's not, to, it's not only in credit unions that have that problem. Wherever you have human beings, you have those interpolitical issues. No other comments need to be said. We have all sorts of examples all over the world of the difficulties associated with that. So it's not, it's not something that is a credit union problem alone. It's a human issue, but one that has to be approached with a certain degree of tact and sensitivity in terms of getting it done, right? The management aspects. Well, putting these various things together is not a, it's not a it requires no little effort. It requires coordination. Coordination and cooperation, um, and also a timeline in terms of how we do it. And there are certain things that take time um, to develop the ideas, to develop the platforms, to transition them, to get little widgets and the dots to line up. Right? We all, we some, we many times underestimate that from an operational perspective, and those are operational issues that fall under the heading of management. And there are significant challenges in that regard in terms of moving forward. If your if your base platform is not strong, then you can't just transition. You have to strengthen the base first to get to a position where you can put it onto a new platform and a platform, new platform in everything else. So it requires some integration. It requires standardization. Uh, it, it, it requires um, differences in work routines. Uh, it requires differences in terms of operational standards and procedures, uh, in terms of what, what becomes normative and how we do it. Right, today for today and standard operating principles in terms of making certain that their rules of engagement are operate on a daily basis by transaction, by, by transaction set. So it's not a, they're not small issues, right? But they have to be segregated. They have to be broken down so you could get at them. Fantastic. And just just one more question. And, and this this is from my realm. I heard you, you speak you spoke about uh, you know the credit union sector have to make a decision whether whether we're looking at co cooperation or consolidation. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the the innovative space, and I know you, you coined um, a term from a particular author looking at all uh, financial um, services um, com financial companies. Financial services firms. Or, financial services firms mm -hmm. and in terms of that you, you spoke to innovation being disruptive so is it that we require a, a cooperative consolidation <laughs> in and it, I took a coin that term in particular a cooperative consolidation in order to facilitate that disruptive innovation well, that, that would be the best way. I, I mean, yeah. you, you could take examples from the way other financial institutions have done it. Um, for example, they've gotten together. With, if, the, if the costs are expensive in the back office, well, how can we um, deliver back office services? Now, that requires a certain commonality in approach, a certain standardization and function. And you have to have some mass, right, to be able to get to it. Everybody has to operate on the same platform. Now, within the 127 credit unions, we have a wide degree of variation wide degree of variation. Um, so they don't all fit nicely. And that's where the consolidation comes in. You have to get to the point of facility that. Now, um, the, 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 the moral story to drive a car, and, and we now have, we now recognize the different ways of, of fueling the car, different sort of engine. Um, you can do electric, you could do um, uh, different types of fuel types. Um, you could use the, the fossil fuel type as well. Um, but the moral, you have to, you have to, you have to switch. If you're using one or the other, you can't use the same engine, right? 
you have to you have to switch it around now that is that is where the cooperation and consolidation take place. do we have one size do we operate at um, the smaller credit unions first or deal with the bigger credit unions so the bigger credit unions operate down and absorb some of the smaller ones those are the competitive issues that sort themselves out the way that tends to sort itself out is on the basis of relationship and leadership excellent looking at that proportionality perspective excellent so i mean as far as as that goes um i know i will have to i just checking on some questions here all right yes well, I mean, in terms of the leadership, persons asking about the the base, the base of the movement being being that guide for the leadership, because as you would know, I know you are a, a credit union practitioner for a number of years, <laughs> so I know right. you would know that that you know uh, the 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 real drive ought to come. I mean, in the whole governance model, ought to come from among the membership to lead the, the head in a particular mm -hmm. direction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, they, so the challenge there is if that drive is not coming from the requisite space, you know, it, will it happen in the timing and well, in, in the perspective that required? Yes. The opportunity sometimes bring leaders to the fore. Yeah. Um, and you would find that in financial services, as in any other type of business, um, the, the outliers, the ones who have done the best, uh, have, often been driven, uh, have often been driven by leaders who are driven. So, for example, uh, in the case of financial services, um, if you want, the change in the financial services started off with, with Citibank um, and, and Walter Riston, in a sense, who literally created a, a new financial services world. Um, and, and certainly in the North American market that has piggybacked and found its way backwards in terms of other, other major financial markets. But I just simply look at at a particular point in time. The banking model that we follow um, generally all over the world actually originates in Germany. Right? It's, not, it's, not a, it's not a North American invention. It's in fact, a, a, they, we, they copied one bank. That bank still exists. Right, is as operated, but its model is what has become the norm for almost most banking models. Right, so that the, you 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 tend people move towards uh, a, a certain trend when they recognize that it's successful and they follow it. Right, so that the same thing will happen. It, it sometimes it's organic, sometimes the, the change is forced on on you by by changes in the, inter, the, the either the international or the domestic financial situation. I use Jamaica as an example. Um, where the consolidation was required in the both the banking sector as well as the financial as well as credit unions, um, precisely because there there were you know it needed it needed consolidation it needed some efficiency to be put in, right? So that it comes from a, a different areas. So how who will lead who will follow, um, and and here's the point from a regulatory perspective, the regulate and that's one of the reasons why the regulators. If you look at all the financial stability the report, the financial stability reports recognize the importance of taking a sectoral approach. And when I say a sector, the financial services sector, in that uh, financial services uh, literally, um, they reflect what is taking place in the real sector. So it's important that you deal with it, make certain it, it's stable, so that you can have regulatory intervention. Um, that generally comes too late. Um, and it comes because there's a crisis, and the crisis is at the wrong time. Um, so that, but it forces change moving forward. The, the better way is what we would consider to be the organic way, where organizations and institutions find their way and develop a place. Now, we, we probably will find somebody who is, is a smart cookie, who's going to start, who's going to make some differences in one credit union, one of the larger ones, and is going to make a space for themselves. And then you're going to find a couple of people falling, falling into line. <laughs> but I can't, I can't predict the future in that regard. If I were active in the credit union movement, and I will, I will what you call it, lead in one, I know what I would do. All right, so I'll leave that for the time being, just in case it happens. <laughs> Excellent. I don't know if you've been prophetic there. Um, and just, 
and this is a question that always comes up. So I take any opportunity to, to place it before you. A cooperative or credit union bank is always a topic of discussion. Mm. And here, here you're speaking about the innovative space, and I know you also have the, the banking industry experience. Mm -hmm. um, is there a future for that within this space? Well, because with, with that, that is unfortunately a, a, an idea um, from a time long gone by. And the people who are holding on have not understood the, the, the reality of the changes. That's why I use the term financial services firm. The whole concept of a credit union bank, some of the other presumes that the, the, the credit unions can't be a bank, right? But there's nothing stopping them from being a bank. So this, this, this idea that you have to have a bank, right? That belongs to the credit union movement. Well, you, every credit union is a bank. It's a financial services firm. The point is they have not made the mental transcription to understanding what their role is and what they can do in the intermediation process, right? So it's, a, it's an idea whose time has long passed and it should be buried. I know they might not like that idea. Yeah. <laughs> but thank I, as usual, very frank, open discussion and commentary. Mr. Brown, we want to thank you so much. I, I know you, you mentioned your time is limited, so you may be departing from the session earlier. So I really wanted to, to put each and every question and, and to you and give you the opportunity to respond. We really appreciate you having been a part of this forum and I mean, hopefully this is the beginning of, of many more to come, especially in some open discussions. And I mean, the corridors of Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies really need to be a, a sounding board and an echoing chamber for some, some topical issues and some, some developmental purpose discussion. So thanks so much for that. And, and, the, and the one point I want to make to them, this is the next bank, simple, this is the bank. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, that, uh, as the saying goes, it's the personal bank. It's the Mario, it's the Mariano Brown branch. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for the Thank you very much for, for, for listening intently. Thank you. Very welcome. Yes, and uh, thank you, Mr. Brown, for that perspective. And I know um, you have your previous engagement, your prior engagement, as you indicated. And I'm sure we will have the opportunity to discuss as we move forward in terms of the other presenters. Colin, you're muted. <laughs> I don't know if you know that. Thank you so much, Candice, because actually I was introducing you. <laughs> and so, yes, we have Candice Matthews and she's Currently, the Member Relations and Communications Specialist at Leading Edge Credit Union. However, Candice is an experienced Member Relations Specialist working in the cooperative financial services industry. She is skilled in communications planning, nonprofit governance, team building, management, and project coordination. Now, as a strong communication-based professional. She really goes about helping to develop and support the strategic objectives usually targeted at improving member and non-member perception, awareness, and understanding of the credit union. She also works to strengthen member relations and cooperative understanding, and very importantly, is an active community volunteer and cooperative enthusiast and today we are really privileged to have Miss Candice Matthews from the Leading Edge Credit Union in Canada where she will bring her perspective to this session touching on the topic building financial health within communities specifically from a Canadian perspective. So Without further ado, please put your hands together the virtue, in this virtual space for Ms. Candice Matthews as we welcome her to the podium. Candice, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Colin. 
Um, and, and unfortunately, Mr. Brown has left the call, but I was about to ask him how long he's been sitting on our board of directors and in our meetings and listening in because uh, that uh, those questions that he posed at the end were very mm -hmm. important questions and questions that um, as a as a cooperative bank, I will use that word uh, as a credit union in, in our space, in our neck of the woods, we certainly ask those questions frequently and they do guide our strategic direction and strategic planning. So excellent uh, presentation from, from Mr. Brown and thank you all for having me here. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um and you can let me know if there's an issue with that at all right you're seeing it and hearing you load on seeing it wonderful um and going to share sound as well <laughs> for the video that we have a little bit later um so i'd like to first just uh, start off again by saying thank you uh, very much for having me i noticed in the the promotional materials that you sent out you said uh, that I was providing the Canadian perspective. I don't know if it's, the, <laughs> I definitely made that change to a Canadian perspective, uh, but there are certainly a lot of commonalities within this, this space, so I'm, I'm happy to be here. So just to give a little bit of context uh, to where I'm coming from and, and joining you, you fine folks today, um, I'm in uh, specifically in Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada, so that's the most easterly province. Uh, we have five branches in our credit union. Um, and we are, uh, again, kind of to speak to uh, Mr. Brown's, um, you know, perspective on what credit unions need, we're in the middle of a merger. Um, so we are merging with another credit union, it's a neighboring credit union, and if you can see my screen, um, it's really going to take in the rest of this western portion of our province and right up into uh, the Labrador region, so we'll become the second biggest credit union in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador and uh, serving uh, about just about 20,000 uh, or so members. So for context, there are nine credit unions in our province, 38 locations, and we have about 61,000 members thereabouts um, in our system. So we certainly don't have the, uh, the market penetration that you enjoy in your part of the world, um, but we do, um, enjoy some significant um, wallet share, we'll say. You know, we have uh, full service members, so they, uh, a good percentage of our members would consider us to be their primary banking uh, platform. Um, so that's something that we're very proud of. Uh, to add a little bit more context, I put this one in here, Colin, after we spoke yesterday to show just how far away <laughs> uh, we are. Um, and you can imagine our climate is quite different. So, <laughs> so there you are. So what I wanted to talk about uh, today was just a little bit about where we came from when it came uh, to, I guess, evaluating as a credit union, what being a cooperative bank really meant. I think as many credit unions tend to do, we uh, get bogged down in, in the business of being a credit union. And that is extremely important. Our number one uh, priority to our membership is to provide them with excellent banking services. Um, and advice centered around their best needs. Uh, and we were doing that. We were doing really well with that. Um, but, you know, we were also prompted to really start to evaluate how we were living these cooperative principles that we all, um, that are foundational, I guess, to, to the creation of credit unions and cooperatives. Uh, here in Canada right now, um, we actually have National Co-op Week. So we're, we're in the middle of National Co-op Week as well. Um, and Credit Union Day uh, lies on that Thursday in, in co-op week every year. So it is a real celebration of, of what we do, but we had to really evaluate if we were celebrating what we do, if we were being honest and true to the cooperative principles and values on which we, uh, on which are, you know, were, were founded. So we did this by taking a look at the principles and doing a bit of a co-op audit, uh, we're going to say, sitting down and, and really evaluating where we stood and what we were doing in each of the principles. And what we did find was that those last three principles of education, training, and information, cooperation amongst cooperatives, and concern for community were areas where we definitely felt we weren't living our values, we weren't living our principles. Um, so that led us to doing a bit of a deeper dive into, uh, into our commitment to our members. 
And I think that uh, that Mr. Brown touched on this, um, and and some others have touched on it in the in the in the call. Dr. Henry also hit on those three pillars. Those are extremely important pillars um, that you know that we all have to to touch on as as co-ops and credit unions of diversification, food security, and leave no one behind. So those really do speak to uh, what we do as well, um, and they all factor in and I found myself during this whole morning wanting to kind of jump in and say hey we, we do something cool in this area um, and, and I'm going to try to stay in my lane but I did want to note that um, there's a commonality there uh, from, from our area of the world to your area of the world. We also live on an island. Food security is also a big, um, a big concern in, in, our, in our area on our island. Um, and so is economic diversification. So I just wanted to kind of do that little shout out while I had it uh, while I had it in my head um, that we have a lot more in common than, than we often think. So back to how this all factors into a vision. And uh, you know, Mr. Brown touched on, on that everything starts with a great vision. Um, I, I noted as he was speaking that we talk about leadership, but we also talk about the need for change. And it's very important to remember that change doesn't happen at an organizational level. Change happens at an individual level. P organizations don't change, people change. And then the organizations can implement those big initiative changes or those big um, regulatory changes that are needed to advance the whole system. But, uh, but if we don't have organizations made up of, of, of groupings of individuals who understand why, who understand who we are, what needs to happen to get there, why it's important for them to perform in their role in order to get there, and that they're a part of something bigger, then change is, is less likely to be successful. So that's, that's one of those tenets that we have to understand, I think, as leaders, uh, as influencers, um, as regulatory bodies going forward, that individuals have to understand their role in change so that we can all move forward together as a society. Uh, and cooperate, which is essentially what we should be very good at. Um, so we, back to this kind of diagram, um, our members were really in a very unique situation, and I'm sure everyone on this, on this call knows that, in that we are both beholden to our members and serving them. Um, there are customers, there are bosses, all at the same time. And that's a very, very unique situation, which makes them different types of stakeholders at the same time. Right? You, have, you have to identify their stakeholder values as consumers and their stakeholder values as, as you know, potentially governing <laughs> members uh, with rights and obligations um, that are separate from just being the standard consumer of financial products or services. So uh, when we built our mission out, we made sure that we had those three pillars equally represented um, in our mission so that we can't forget we're a bank. We can't forget we're a cooperative financial institution. We must deliver quality products and exceptional service in order to get that full wallet share and that, be that full service institution so that our members do, do not need to go elsewhere to seek services. Um, we have to do that via knowledgeable and professional staff. They need Our staff needs to understand their role, why we do this, and they need to be very committed to making sure that they're able to deliver on our, our value promise to our membership. Uh, but equally as important, and this is the thing that we really had to work on, was that our cooperative principles and values must be upfront and fundamental to the delivery of our service. It has to be measured. Um, you know, we have to set, set, you know, high arching but achievable goals in terms of, of our cooperative uh, performance in this space. So I'm sure some of you maybe have heard this before, but uh, one of the things that we did um, when measuring the vision uh, was develop a, a balanced scorecard approach. So when we present our financial results every year at our AGM to our members, we also prevent our association results. We also present our, our performance in how we live co-op values, principles, um, what we do, and it's measurable. You know, we make sure that we, we measure it. We don't just check right. We don't just say uh, we're just going to fund this or fund that or shake hands or, or do this. We're, we're a bit of a, we take a bit of a hands dirty approach to making sure that, that there's balance to our strategy. Um, so, you know, making sure that 
for everything that we measure from a financial performance perspective, we also measure it um, from a uh, from an association performance. So, um, you know, we offer checkings and, and savings and, and there are fees associated with some of those accounts. Uh, we also offer nonprofit accounts to community organizations, uh, NPOs, and we don't charge for those accounts because those individual organizations are responsible for the health um, of our communities in so many ways. So if they're paying us in fees, um, you know, that's money that they're not maintaining in their own uh, organizations to, to deliver on their mandate. So to do that good work. So uh, we also report to our memberships when we don't take things. So forfeited revenue, we don't take these fees from our community. Uh, we offer discounts to senior members to keep more money in their, uh, in their pockets. Um, you know, we've, I'll talk a little bit later about the daycare um, cooperative that we, we set up. So we offered them a, a completely interest-free mortgage. And that, you know, amounts to thousands and thousands of dollars a year um, that, that they don't have to pay to their financial institution um, that they can use to deliver on their mandate to, uh, to deliver affordable quality childcare services. So at any point, um, Colin, I know this is, uh, uh, if you want to jump in or if you have a question, I'm happy to stop. I'm happy to answer questions um, as we go. Uh, so I just wanted to, to put that out there. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more now about the role that our credit union played in developing cooperative partnerships. So um, in one of our communities, uh, it was strongly identified by community stakeholders that um, we did not have adequate spaces for childcare services in our town. Um, this is a problem in so many ways, not just because, you know, people need childcare, but there's a reason that, that a community is healthy when you have great early, child, uh, early childhood education services. There are so many benefits uh, to the community when, when you have that in place. So before I go on, I'm just going to show you a a short video, and I hope it works, on the impact that the Child Care Centre had on our small community of uh, Port of Basque, Newfoundland. I always felt, even when I was a kid growing up, I wanted to make a difference in children's lives. My name is Glenda Osmond, and I am the administrator here at Growing Your Future. It is the newest day here, here in Port of Basque. We're the first new centre built on the island in the last 13 years. Right now we have 10 staff members and we can take 34 children at our facility. Growing Our Future is a cooperative. We were formed by a board of families, uh, people in the community who felt there was a need for a child care center. All of our families who avail of this service, they are a member of this co-op. Uh, what that means is they buy a share, they have a say in anything and everything that kind of goes on here. I can hardly describe the feelings uh, that I felt when I first heard this building was going to happen. And I can't express enough the importance this place has in the overall broad scheme of the community. I have a four-year-old daughter who's uh, been attending this new daycare since it opened. Having a stake in a place like this as a member is really important. Uh, not because I ever expected or want to be involved in the decision-making processes towards some smaller things, but if there were a big issue that I felt like I needed to play an active role in communicating, uh, that would be my opportunity. Leading Edge Credit Union is a major contributor to this day here. They were our first partnership. They've stepped up and they've been the backbone of this place. The community of Port of Ass to me means a sense of home. I choose to raise my children in this community. I feel safe in this community. I feel the community supports us. I mean, if I reached out and called up somebody, they are willing to, you know, give their time, give their efforts. If I said that I was building a fence, I'd probably have turned people away. I feel very proud to be a part of this day here, and I feel what we offer is second to none. Okay, so that worked out well, did it? <laughs> you could all hear it? Wonderful. 
So uh, before the, the video started, we were talking a little bit about why a credit union um, would invest time and money and, and, you know, all of their resources in building a child care center in a community. Um, and we do that based on, you know, social return on investment. It really is our mandate to make sure that we have healthy, um, you know, financially healthy, uh, socially healthy communities, because that contributes to ultimately to, you know, a healthier society, but a healthier bottom line for the credit union. You know, our members are very connected to community. So it's really important to do that. And, and what studies have shown is that there's actually a seven to one return on investment uh, for childcare, um, childcare investments, uh, just in terms of, uh, I guess, investments in early childhood education that comes along with those regulated childcare spaces. So it's more than just babysitting. It is really uh, setting those children up for success as they go into their primary education years. And ultimately, it ends up being uh, impacting, you know, having lower levels of unemployment in your community and your society, lower incarceration, incarceration rates, um, uh, you know, better mental health outcomes for people who have early access to childhood, uh, uh, to education uh, early in childhood. Um, and it also, you know, leads to higher levels of secondary school completion and overall healthier individuals, the more empathetic individuals. They're better at self-regulation, critical thinking, and knowledge acquisition. And when you think of a society that invests in this on a large scale, uh, you can see quickly how those returns can start to snowball and manifest throughout your entire community and society. And, you know, those, those, those good returns end up, you know, exponentially growing uh, over time. So, I mean, it's, it really is uh, the best case scenario. Also, from an, an economic perspective, um, you keep good people in your communities when you offer these types of services that families need. We had situations where we were losing uh, professional families because we weren't able to, kind of, to accommodate their ability to stay in the community from a childcare perspective. So we, we lost doctors, we lost executives um, that would go to bigger centers where they had access to more of these, uh, these recreational services or childcare services in their community. So huge benefits to the community when you invest here. Um, and that kind of leads over into that type of intersectional approach to, to economic recovery or economic development. Um, in the case of, of COVID-19, that relationship between childcare and economic recovery has been uh, amplified, certainly, uh, by the pandemic. So I found um, some resources by, um, I'm, I don't want to mispronounce this name. I'm going to say Shivani, Danielle, uh, Jas Jaislin, Jaislin? <laughs> Uh, but she, actually, interestingly enough, she's originally from Trinidad and Tobago, um, and she's a lawyer educated in New York and talked a lot about um, the intersectional uh, response or approach to women's recovery in particular. Um, really, women are at the lowest level of workforce participation uh, since the 80s. Um, so this is a, this is extremely uh, concerning, I think, because uh, especially the fact that not all inequality is equal. So when you're looking at things like childcare services, when you're looking at things like other interventions of your products and services that might help uh, reduce some of those barriers to economic success or recovery, this is the role that cooperatives and credit unions have to play in our society going forward. It's much more uh, than a nice to do, it's a need to do. We have an obligation, I think, uh, based on our, our foundation uh, and, the, and that role that we have to play in society. But uh, here in Canada, um, I mean, South Asian women um, and Black women have nearly, you know, 20% or more unemployment rates where, you know, compared to uh, their white counterparts, which is uh, closer to a six, six and a half percent. I, that is staggering gap. That is a staggering difference. And um, a lot of it is, is chalked up to the pandemic. Some of it is just chalked up to it's just wrong. It's been wrong for a long time. We know the difference um, and we have to work together. I think um, as, as cooperatives, we have to educate each other. We have to educate our societies on how intersectionality um, plays a role. You know, that inequality is not equal. Um, we can't rise until we all rise equally. So uh, use the voices and the platforms that we have to bring 
um, to bring, you know, awareness to this, but more than just awareness, there's a lot of awareness out there. What we need is action. We need to, to use and leverage our, our, our services, um, our business models, everything that we can to play a role in, in economic recovery, in social advancement, in things like that. So um, this is something that, you know, takes some work and it, and it takes either developing new co-ops or redeveloping or rethinking the way that your existing cooperatives and credit unions do business. How, you know, how big is the buy-in? Do you have some people, you know, in the center of your organization that are very keen on this, but leadership, you don't have leadership buy-in. Um, you know, does your organization support committing resources to, to social enterprise development or co-op development at the highest levels? Because again, it goes back to that setting up of that, of that balance sheet. Are you measuring your performance and proudly reporting it to your memberships? And then once you do that, they begin to expect it. If we were to suddenly stop reporting um, on our uh, on the work that we do for community impact or on our balanced scorecard, that would be missed and questioned by our membership. And that's that is the role of, of our membership. It's it's almost a it might be a bit backwards now because of the way things have gone, but it's our role now to to educate our members to the fact that that it's their responsibility and right to expect this, right? So there, there may be a role in education reversal, but it's almost, we need, to, we need to educate our members to hold us accountable. And I think that that's the biggest thing we need to be held, held accountable um, for the, the foundational aspects of, of, of being a co-op credit union. So um, the other thing that we need are strong relationships with our community. Um, you know, when it comes to the feasibility identification uh, of some of these projects, um, it was essentially our community that alerted. We were listening when we do our annual member surveys. We ask specific questions about, you know, outside of your financial services, we ask lots of questions about their satisfaction with that as well. But outside of those financial services, you know, what are, what are some of the things that you need in your community? What are your priorities? What's, what's most important to you um, in terms of seeing a healthy uh, community? So that, that level of engagement, and that's at a minimum of, of just asking, um, setting up opportunities for, you know, for that engagement with your membership, whether that be focus groups or just training your frontline employees to be attentive to the things that are coming in. They're your biggest and best conduit to, uh, to the communities. And you find that when you have a strong values-based organization, those employees are the ones that are out in their communities and they're volunteering, right? So we collect the information about our employees' volunteering habits. Uh, you know, not, it's not mandatory, but that when they, off, they offer it up to us and we report that as well. We say, you know, we have strong values and, and this is what we do in our in our communities and there's where we volunteer and these are the organizations that benefit from us whether that's time donated during work hours or time donated by our employees outside of work hours so you really get a good sense of of where community needs are when you listen to um, when you listen to your employees as well visibility in the community is important um, and that extends well beyond promotional visibility not just promoting your services but also being out there as, as a community supporter, as a community member, as someone who's invested in the, um, in the success of your community overall. So, you know, we, we end up with lead, enable, and participate in any combination possible. You know, not everything, you can't be everything to everyone, but, um, but going out there and, and, and being actively engaged is, is extremely important. So that brings me over, I don't want to take up too, too much time, but that brings me over to one of the programs that we're looking at launching next year. Um, we've had a bit of a soft launch with it, and this was um, a, a trademark program of the, uh, the credit union that we're merging with, actually. Um, so they, they call it the We Care program, and the CARE stands for Credit Advice, Repair, and Education. So this is really about identifying those people in your communities that have barriers to financial success at an individual level. Um, you know, this is not something that you're going to get a lot of um, success with if you just kind of wait for people to come in and identify that I, I, you know, because people don't know what they don't know. 
So it's really important to identify those community partners, whether they be women's centers, whether they be uh, centers where, you know, for us, for new Canadians are coming in and, and they really need that help with establishing themselves and their credit in, in a new country. Uh, rehabilitation programs, whether that comes from, you know, uh, drug rehabilitation, mental health rehabilitation, or reintegration, you know, programs from incarceration facilities. So these are, are, are some typical areas where people have barriers to fully either integrating or reintegrating into society at an individual level. So they need helping hands. They need people to kind of grab them by the hand and say, you know, here's what this means. Here's a full credit report review. Here's what you have coming in and going out and the very basics of budgeting, uh, expense tracking. And then once you get them there, once you start getting them to understand about financial empowerment and getting those financial literacy pieces embedded, then, you know, setting them up on a monthly budget, setting them up with a savings plan. Um, once you have that education in place, that's when you come in and you step in with the helping hands loan. You step in with something that keeps them away from payday lenders, keeps them away from those high interest rate lenders that are predatory and gives them something that's a low interest rate that is designed to help rebuild, reestablish, or, or in fact, you know, establish for the first time that, that credit rating for them. So these are some programs that, although they don't have a huge impact on the overall community, the more credit unions that do this, the more co-ops that do this, you know, everything has that, it's like the aggregate of marginal gains, right? So those small changes make those big impacts uh, over time. So that, that's just something that I wanted to, to highlight as an example of when they talk about consolidation or cooperation, it's, I don't think it's an or question. It's an and thing. You have to both consolidate. We are doing it. It's the need is there. It's recognized. My dog is, is waiting. I'm so sorry. I said this wouldn't happen, but it is. Um, and we ha also have to talk about cooperation amongst cooperatives, right? We have to, I'm just going to let him in so that he stops waiting. Um, we have to let those, you know, let those cooperatives work together. We have to share resources. We have to share information. Um, so that those things are, are extremely important. So, you know, I'll leave it. I could speak all day. Um, I could talk about every point that, that the other speakers made, uh, but leave it off with education and awareness. And, and essentially, that's a slow moving train. And, and I agree, we have to be agile and innovative in our product and service delivery and diligent in our education and awareness. Um, you know, so be, be willing to commit the resources. Don't think that you're going to write a check and these problems are going to be solved because these problems are only solved with, with working together and with cooperation and with really getting our, your hands dirty and understanding um, that and, you know, understanding everything right from the data in your balance sheet, what that says about your consumer behavior, what your employees are saying about their communities, you know, just it runs the whole gamut of being strategically analytical about your role in and with society that, that you know, that you're operating your business in. Um, so, and again, be transparent. Um, report your co-op performance alongside your financial performance and demonstrate leadership in, in showing that those two are equally as important um, and, and the financial performance. We're a business and we have to be a business, but we're never going to achieve uh, efficiency ratios that, that the banks are because we're not banks. Banks are beholden to a different set of values and that's fine for them, but that's not who we are. So I think understanding that we have to, um, we have to tolerate, uh, I guess, some different efficiency ratios that make us sustainable, but we can't emulate the banks because you bet that here in Canada, at least the banks are emulating us. They're, they're trying to eat our grass. They're trying to say that they're, you know, community participants. They, um, but then on the, on the other side of it, they, they go and lobby the government of Canada to, um, to, to mandate that credit unions are not allowed to use the word bank. So that was our biggest, our biggest fight recently, uh, right at, at a federal level was they tried to um, prevent us from ever calling ourselves a bank. And they won. We're not allowed to say it. We're allowed to say we provide banking services. We're allowed to say you can do your banking with us, but we cannot say that we are a bank. So <laughs> I break the rules. 
fairly often by calling us a cooperative bank, but we're a cooperative financial institution. <laughs> so I, that's, that's all I had, Colin. <laughs> I hope that wasn't too fast or confusing. No, uh, no, 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 no. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that, Candice. And just before we, we get too far, a question I must ask, because in the reporting required for local credit unions, and I'm going to speak for Trinidad and Tobago, and I know for the region, the financial audit is such an important part of the, of the dynamic. And I see you have their co-op audit, which I'm juxtaposing to be a social audit. Yes, complete a cooperative audit. If I, from um, a Canadian perspective, how how um, how ingrained is that social audit into the, the reporting mechanism of the Canadian credit union movement? And do you see a growing trend? Absolutely. Um, that trend has been growing um, to the point now where it would be conspicuously absent. Uh, you know, if, if a credit union in particular were to uh, decide not to report on, although some of them, I don't think a lot of them, you know, do complete co-op audits, you know, to the, to the letter of, of, of the standard, um, you know, the ideal standard or best practice of a co-op audit, they all do report in some way, shape or form about their community impact performance. Um, and that is, that is an absolute, uh, I feel like it's an essential, but the, 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 the funny thing is, is that um, commercial banks are also doing that now, right? They are also, per, uh, they're presenting their community impact, um, their, their social purpose. It, you know, they have these, these reports that they put out that, uh, because stakeholders and shareholders and customers, consumers, they're starting to demand that now. They want to know, you know, the ethics of, of what that company is doing. And some would argue that, well, not everyone cares. And, and that's correct. You know, not everyone does care. But more and more now, and especially with the demographic of consumers that are coming up to replace those that are aging out, um, they do demand that, that leaders have a certain set of ethics, that leaders are demonstrating, um, you know, more progressive views on things, right? So, so you are seeing the companies um, come in with these things, but but as co-ops, uh, absolutely, and and that's been around for a long time. But the trend is certainly uh, growing in terms of more um, in-depth reporting. It's great. The audience is loving it. Uh, we're getting some positive feedback. I mean, we have um, just about one hundred and thirty persons online. Wonderful. From across Trinidad and Tobago, and also from across the Caribbean, we've seen Grenada, we've seen Antigua and Barbuda, and I know you you describe the proximity to to the Caribbean peace <laughs> from climate and, and other perspectives, and it's interesting to hear about the community engagement. And I I am reserving some questions for that question and answer segment, which will take place because we have a lot of commentary on it and definitely um, we will be sharing those perspectives in the future discussion. Candice, thank you so much. We're looking forward to your responses and of course feel free, persons online, um, please your questions or comments in the chat and Candice, when we, we come to that bridge of answering questions, feel free also to engage in any, um, on any on comments or on any topic which may have been raised uh, prior especially Mr. Brown's topic. So thanks so much. And we will get deeper into this discussion. So thank you. <laughs> yes, welcome. And next we go to Mr. Ne oh, you're muted again. <laughs> you're not meant to introduce people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I feel I'll get a video and just introduce them. In. <laughs> yes, thanks so much. But our next presenter is Mr. Nigel Matthew. He is no stranger to the cooperative and credit union movement, but 
Mr. Matthew is the lead consultant with the firm NEM Leadership Consultants. And this is a hybrid management and leadership consultancy practice with the aim of assisting businesses to achieve growth and sustainability. Now, Mr. Matthew has over 28 years management and executive experience in the financial industry. He's a chartered accountant and a fellow of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants of the United Kingdom. And he's also a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Trinidad and Tobago. He holds a postgraduate master's degree in finance from Henley Management College and the University of Reading in the UK. And he's a certified professional in anti-money laundering from the Florida International Bankers Association based in Florida International University. He's also a certified speaker, coach, and teacher with the renowned John Maxwell team. He is an accredited director from the Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators in Canada, one of the world's reputable organizations on cooperative governance. And he is a past associate lecturer with the University of Reading in the Faculty of Leadership, Organizations and Behavior. And he has delivered numerous presentations in terms of transformation, leadership, and change management in order for leaders to develop and manage the transition of change. Mr. Matthew is also a former president of one of the largest financial cooperatives in the Caribbean and a former member of the advisory board of the Human Resource Master's Program, the MBA, at the Arthur Lockjack Graduate School of Business. Currently, he's the chairperson of the Henley Alumni Association Caribbean Chapter and sits on the Alumni International Board and affiliate of the Henley Business School out of the University of Reading. And of course, he touches on his social purpose as well as a board and council member of the Princess Elizabeth Center, which is the Princess Elizabeth Home for Handicapped Children Association. His areas of expertise include leadership, management, development, strategic planning, business transformation, change management, mortgage portfolio management, coaching, and anti-money laundering compliance. So without any further necessary introduction. <laughs> We'd like to welcome Mr. Nigel Matthew oh. to speak us through his presentation this morning as he looks at the entrepreneurial journey to financial resilience. So Mr. Matthew, the 130 plus viewers are now at your disposal. Okay, um, thank you. Very much, Colin. Are you hearing me? Loud and clear, sir. And see the presentation as well. Yes. Right. Good, 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 good. Uh, all right. Thank you again for the uh, Ministry of Youth Development and National Service. And of course, the Superiority Labor College um, for inviting me here to speak on, on this topic. And of course, let me um, pay well homage to the previous two speakers, Mr. Mariano Brong. And, and Candice Matthews all the way out of, of, out of Canada. And I think they did you know, really, really, really excellent um, job. So it's really tough to come behind such, you know, extreme speakers. <laughs> but I'm going to, you know, try my best in terms of um, the topic that you asked me to address um, this morning. So the topic that you, you want me to look at is um, the entrepreneurial journey to financial resilience. All right. And... Um, this is on the, on the heels of um, the theme of credit union um, year, week, month, business financial health for brighter tomorrow. So that um, I, I'm going to try to do justice to it, but in terms of context, um, it's going to be a bit different from what Mariano said, and of course, Candice, in terms of the community spirit, you know, those type of stuff. So coming from a background of the credit union, as you mentioned, I, I, I you know, being part of the, as an employee, and also as a director, chairperson, chairman, that type of stuff. I think I understand, you know, some of the challenges, especially in this time of change, and then blending that to where I am now as, you know, um, entrepreneur, you know, business person, that type of thing. And, you know, whether we need to, to, to make that transition across. 
Oh, so we, we're going to look at that, and I hope that you know uh, we'll be able to provide some insights into in, in, into that. Um, I just changed my slide. Um, I'm not too sure if you've seen the second slide. Okay, it's coming up. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is not about me. It's all about um, the members and. In Trinidad and of course the Caribbean and of course Canada who are also on the line. And um, but this is a little about me. But first and foremost, I am a credit unionist. I'm a cooperator. I, I I advise credit unions in terms of maybe development, what to do, what not to do, as it case to be, um, blending with their ideas at least to make the, the, the movement better, to strengthen it, so to speak. Um, so that is what I I, I want to bring to the table this morning. And this is really from an entrepreneurial spirit. Now, the, the question I think we need to ask in, in the movement is how resilient is a credit union movement in an ever-changing world? Because you know that um, we had the, the, the financial meltdown in the, around 2008, year about, and now we are trusted upon this, 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 this you know, external shock that we call COVID. The, to me, the, the difference between what happened in 2008, 2007, is that it, it affected financial organizations and yeah, individuals with their mortgages and their loans and so forth, as opposed to COVID, which basically affected all of us. You know, whether you're an adult, whether you're in the financial system, whether you're in business, in manufacturing or transport, or being part of the value chain, it even affected children and babies as well. So it is much more profound in terms of the impact on businesses and of course the world at large, and the issue is how do we come out of this in terms of being resilient as a credit union, as a maybe individual unit, and more so as um, a, a sector? You know, how, how, how can we survive? You know, how can we sustain? How can we grow? How can we expand? How can we add value to our members? All right. So I want to sort of touch on that, you know, as we move along. And of course, I, I believe it's a, it's a fitting theme in terms of, um, you know, building financial health for a brighter tomorrow. And, and when I hear that, I, 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 I believe I, I look at maybe an individual having what we call discretionary income or surplus monies in the bank, stocks and shares, unit trust, and that type of situation. And it's the same thing for a credit union, you know? How can we build or strengthen the credit union's fortress balance sheet so that they can have a better tomorrow for their members, okay? But that comes from maybe doing something right in terms of adding value, um, you know, doing loans, you know, being a good corporate citizen, corporate responsibility and so forth. So we need to have that foundation in order for us to have a brighter tomorrow. I know that it's easier said than done, but at the same token, we need to look at how we can do it. And I guess we have to do it through people. And that is what I'm going to sort of um, touch on, you know, as we go along. I think, I think the movement, I think, did well in terms of times of, 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 of hardship, in times of change, because with the credit meltdown, that was a major shock within the financial system, I would say globally. And of course, I know there was an impact in Trinidad and of course, the, the, the Caribbean. And we weathered the storm. You know, I think we weathered the storm quite nicely. We were able to sustain our operations, maybe our performance and that type of stuff. But then, as I said, COVID now is much more widespread. Do we have the wear it all to be resilient and really to, to, to overcome the challenges? So I think that's a big question. Can we really weather the storm in 2021, 2022? We did it 12 years ago, but the environment there was completely different to now, you know? So is it that we need a different mindset, a different set of thinkers, a different set of leaders um, to really come out of this successfully? All right, and that's, I think, is, is, is the major challenge because what happened in the past, as most people would, would, would say, and of course we know that from our insurance days, it, it has nothing to do really with what's gonna to happen tomorrow. Tomorrow gotta to see about itself and today gotta to see about itself in terms of what you do now. All right, so we're gonna you know, try to see if you can mirror that. This is the traditional, I would say, model that um, we use within the financial system, whether it's the credit union system or the banking system, the traditional model. And then, you know, within the movement, the international cooperatives, association, principles, democracy, you know, cooperators, um, that type of stuff. Um, so what we're really doing is really cooperating with, with our members, okay? To have, so they can have confidence to come and save money at the credit union, and then to have confidence to invest in those members or members come and borrow and hopefully pay back. 
So this is the traditional model. So I guess the question we need to ask ourselves going forward, can this model work for us? Can we still hold on to this model in order to be resilient? Okay, what can we do differently? I think Mr. Brown um, mentioned that, you know, um, and I believe, you know, in the time of change, we got to do things differently. We got to sort of shift gear a bit because COVID has, you know, the unprecedented shock has really caused us to, to look at the world and our business model from a completely different perspective. So if, if, if we want to hold on to the past, um, we may find ourselves not really adding the value as we should, and maybe um, a destruction in that, you know, should we stick on our present trajectory. We have an interesting um, situation in Trinidad in terms of the makeup of our credit union sector, okay? And I know Mr. Brock had a little discourse in terms of Barbados situation, Jamaica, and, and, and of course, Trinidad as well. But what we have been having is that two credit unions, two of the largest credit unions, we'll not put the name, but I think we all know the names, um, they really control a third, or almost a third of the entire credit union market in terms of the, the, the credit union movement sector. You know, so it's a heavy concentration, you know, two persons, you know, two organizations, you know, um, so one need to look if is, is that the, the, the right mix. When we look at the, at the top five, the top five, of course, controls more than 50%. We're looking at 56% of the market um, for the top five credit unions in Trinidad and Tobago, right? Highly sort of a disequilibrium, you know, so to speak. But when we look at the, the next, the, the top 10, the top 10, we're looking at 73%. We're looking at 73% of the entire credit union sector market. All right. And the 100 plus, it was mentioned that we have 127 credit unions. So um, over 100 and let's say about 15, 17 credit unions have 27% of the market. In other words, we have a lot of small units adding value to their, to their membership, whether it's a community or maybe, you know, open type of concept but it is highly skewed as compared to what is happening in Jamaica and, and, and Barbados, you know? So one has to ask as a movement, can this model take us into the 21st century? Okay, can this model take us into the 21st century? Because if we look at, assuming there's 127 units and also assuming that we have um, on average, let's say 15 elected officers, you're looking at almost 2000, um, people, you know, managing the sector of a market share of maybe about um, 14 billion, 15 billion, you know, that type of situation one needs to examine from a sectorial standpoint. But this is what it is. And if you know where we are now, I guess we will know where we want to go. And maybe there's a roadmap to take us where we want to go. So it's, it's very interesting, but we got to face reality. Um, just to mention, and I know Mr. Brown mentioned a couple of these um, information before, in, in terms of the composition of the, of the, of, of the assets in Trinidad and Tobago, and um, where we are as a movement, okay? Where we are as a movement. So I know it's, it's a bit small maybe on, on some of your, your screen, but where we are is really um, on top, almost on top, the green bar. So you can see the green little area from 2016 to 2020, and we somewhat remains the same in terms of market share or, or being part of the financial um, system. I think Mr. Brown mentioned 10, 11%. I know some people have different percentages, maybe 5%, 6%, but whatever it is, relatively speaking, it is small. Okay, so to me, that should be an issue for us in the movement in terms of our the financial assets controlled by the credit union sector. And then there's a completely disconnect because we boast about 600 and maybe 75 members. So almost half, well, half, yeah, almost half of the population or more than half of the population, uh, part of the credit union system, but we only own, let's say on average, nine, 10% of the market. So there's a somewhat a disconnect, okay, as compared to the other sectors. Where our monies are, where our monies are in terms of um, 
the asset composition, you know, um, whether the blue on the bottom there is what we call consumer loans. Then we have the business loans, that orange bar, that orange bar there, the business loans, um, and so forth. And then we have the liquid assets, which is in green. So I, I focus more on the three major areas, the blue, the bottom, in terms of the bar, is consumer loans. I think we do a lot of consumer loans within the movement. The business loans, the orange, I don't think we do much. And that is where maybe the focus will be on in terms of my discourse. And of course, where we have liquid assets, whether that is in the bank or, or, or you know, um, short-term investments as it seems to be. So we have to look at whether our asset composition in our credit union um, is reflective of what happened in the industry. And I say that because our financial industry, I think is very robust. I think the other sectors make a lot of money. We make money too in the movement, but I know they make a tremendous amount of money. So that if they are doing that, maybe we can mirror some of their um, approaches. As Candice you know, mentioned, you know, um, they cannot call themselves bank, but they're doing financial services. The banks are sort of stealing some of the ideas, just as what it did to us in Trinidad. Um, they stole our idea of the whole concept of the reducing balance loan situation interest. That, is, that was maybe our distinctive, I would say, advantage. Let's say 20 years ago, 25, not anymore, because the banks are doing it, and they're doing it you know, quite successfully. So that, that's one aspect. When we look at where our main income earner lies, well, of course, loans, and where do we have our loans? As you can see from the financial sector in Trinidad and Tobago, a huge portion, almost half, is in the form of real estate meaning mortgages. And then we have vehicle loans, which is really the orange. I know we do a lot of vehicle loans in the movement, but I'm not too sure if we do much uh, mortgages. All right, so maybe something we need to look at uh, to see if we can really capitalize on that. I know some units do it, but I, the majority of credit unions don't really do mortgages per se, but that is what the industry is telling us. You know, oh, you know, there's a lot of money to be made, you know, but that is easier said than done. We need to look at the, the, the prerequisite building infra infrastructure in order to do, let's say, mortgages and, and, and as we can see, business loans, you know, going forward. So we're talking about building financial health for a better tomorrow. And the issue is how do we go about doing that as a movement given the present configuration? As I said, um, 10 credit unions control 73% of the market, two control a third of the entire market, and the top five control, out of 127, control 56%. So how can we move forward to build financial health and strength within the credit union movement for a better tomorrow? I, I strongly believe that the strength of the credit union movement um, lies with looking at a different business model to really you know, to compete. Because definitely the banks and the insurance companies or the financial service providers, whoever they are, they do the same thing and that we do. And what, what they do is really sell money, okay? So maybe they're selling it maybe better than us. Maybe they have more supplies to sell more. That might be an, an, an argument to look at. But if we look at really getting involved in businesses, but you can only get involved in businesses if you develop your members to be entrepreneurs because your members will be your consumers, and they need financing for their business ventures. Just as maybe I need financing for my business ventures, the members also need that. And I think that's an avenue that the credit union sector can go into, but as I said, it is easier said than done. Notwithstanding the diversification into that new type of business model, we also need, of course, members, okay? Individual members. And I know at present, um, we cannot really lend loans to non-individuals. Um, because of maybe the, 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 the legislation, the regulations. Um, so, but of course, if a member has a business idea, the loan will be on the member's name and there will be some sort of guarantee that to be signed. So at least the credit union's investment can be um, protected. That is all good. But if we control 600, 700,000 people, I think we should have enough lobbying power for the authorities to sort of amend the law so that allow us to do businesses outside of the traditional um, membership zone, 
of course, managing your risk as the case should be. So that is something we need to look at, um, whether we, we want to do it. I know the league and maybe organizations such as CFF or ACAB may have been lobbying, but um, I'm not too sure if our lobbying effort is bearing fruit to take us into a new business model so that we can sustain and of course expand going forward because we have been talking about these things for years, but not much has happened with respect to that, you know, that particular change, all right? But businesses, I think, is, is a way to go in terms of the entrepreneurial journey to financial resilience. So if our members are developed, so too will be the credit unions, okay? So the big question is, how can the financial cooperatives assist with the transition? Moving your members from an employee, a member, a salary type person to an entrepreneur, to a business owner whose um, repayment of loans will come from profit as opposed to repayment of loan would come from salary. We have seen the impact of COVID whereby organizations, business model have changed a lot in other words, they have less employees, okay? Those employees are our members. If they don't, if people are out of a job, they don't have income, okay? So they cannot serve as a loan, they cannot even borrow. And our main income earner, of course, we're looking at loans. So we have a real challenge there. So how, as a movement, can we make that transition? Can we move members in terms of members' development, economic and otherwise, to be entrepreneurs? All right, so that um, we can manage the risk. Hopefully, they are unbanked at this point in time, and we can, you know, provide some sort of financial services. So I think the credit union has a, a golden opportunity to make that transition because most people now, if they are affected because of COVID and loss of job or cutting income, they will not really stay home and cry. You know, they will want to get back into the productive sector by um, maybe starting a small business looking at a, 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 a venture that maybe can make some money as the case will be, but they need financing, they need support. And if we don't do it in the movement, I guess the other financial players will certainly look at that because they're looking at to expand their loans portfolio. So that um, I think the opportunity is now, as opposed to next year or next two years, to really make that leap, make that transition so that you know, we can um, you know, move our members from one strata to the next given environmental changes and the impact it have on, 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 on individuals. So that's, that, 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 that's a big talk. However, we're looking at trans transition from one part to the next. But then I, I like this so much because we talk about in times of change, the learners will in inherit the earth. Meaning the learners or we as individuals who really um, want to learn who really want to live in our current environment and confront what we call the realities or brutal facts. And, you know, they, they devise some sort of model or some sort of thinking to sustain and, and move on. If we hold on to all certainties, meaning our tradition, how it used to be, our storytellers, and not too sure if that will take us forward as a sector and even as a business as well, okay? So the learners, meaning who will inherit the earth. The earth is what we live in now. Whether we have COVID, we got to live with COVID, we got to change our business model. We look how to see where we're positioned within the whole value chain um, um, concept. Um, so that, that, that's very, very instructive, okay? So it's a whole learning game. It's a whole, what we call mental transition to see the world in a different way so that we can come up with ideas in order to survive. If we haven't done that, then we might be, you know, hold on to the past and, you know, I'm not too sure we'll be competitive, you know, moving forward. When we look at a, a particular situation, should we, in terms of the movement, decides to, you know, move in, in, in that direction, where do we go? Or how do we do it in terms of the entrepreneurial infrastructure? Because I know that, um, Colin, I know you give me the topic of entrepreneurial journey to financial resilience, you know? And, and I guess you're speaking about financial resilience for individuals slash members. And of course, they need services. So I guess they can go to the financial, the credit union for financial services. So I think it's an opportunity for the credit unions to look at the infrastructure to service entrepreneurs slash their members, okay? Because they cannot come with a salary slip anymore because they're out of a job. 
They cannot come with the salary slip because instead of working for 10,000, they're now working for 5,000, they may not qualify for the loan. So there must be some other avenue where they can still connect with the credit union. They can still add value to the credit union by paying back, taking loans and paying back. And of course the credit union can add value to them by providing the, 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 the capital to, to start their business. So it is easier said than done, but it is possible. So for instance, if you look at some of the infrastructural, I would say ingredients that we need in the movement, we can look at what we call business targets. You know, how often or, or how, how, how do we use what we call artificial intelligence to identify our members who have already started businesses or to identify our members who may have a skill or who may be willing to start their own business to connect with those people to, you know, kind of groom them to be better businesses, being part of the, the SME sector, Transition, transitioning the members from a small organization, maybe to um, a medium one, maybe to a large one, you know, we got to identify those targets because at the end of the day, members add value to the credit union by you making an investment in them and they paying you back. You lend them 10,000, they pay you back 12,000. You add value of 2,000, well, let's say expenses as the case should be. So we, we have to, we need customers then, or we need members, okay? And members who can borrow. The nature of business, again, there are a plethora of, of opportunities. Business opportunities are, are endless. There's, to me, there's no limit, but the credit union need to understand how business people think, how entrepreneurs think, how I think as, as, as a businessman, um, what would drive me, what are my motives? Try to connect so we can have a win-win situation, okay? We also in the movement, in terms of looking at this new dimension, need to understand what we call business dynamics. Okay, financial dynamics and what we call environmental dynamics in terms of, um, you know, what we call business risk to, to a great extent. Unless we, we understand that and not too sure we'll have the appetite to really entertain um, businessmen, entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurs to come and do business with the credit union. We got to do that. And that starts with the board of directors, maybe the credit committee, the management, you know, as, as the case would be. If we don't understand what we're getting into, it will be difficult to support it. Okay, so that's a whole transition. Financial assessment, I, I think that's a key in terms of building the infrastructure because the loan officer looking at a, a, a pay slip with $10,000 or $5,000 or $15,000 and working out your DSR, that's easy to do. Now there's no pay slip. There's a, there's a set of financial statements. You have balance sheet, you have income statement, you have cash flow projections those type of things. So that's a whole new skill that we need to perform some kind of evaluation, some kind of an assessment to know well whether this, this, this business can make money, um, whether I can lend this money, this member money, whether I can apply conditions to the loan as the case should be. So you know, the financial assessment, and then we also have the risk appreciation aspect of it. And just moving along, um, we also have the strength of the balance sheet. The strength of the balance sheet there, I'll come back to the one that I missed just now. The strength of the balance sheet there is really the capitalization. How strong is our balance sheet within the movement? You know, um, if, if your balance sheet is strong, meaning you are heavily capitalized, meaning you have a lot of what we call institutional money, you can carve out a portion of that and look to see how you can invest that in terms of entrepreneurs providing what we call risk capital to your members so that they can grow their business, okay? So we need to look at that from a more detailed way, understanding market dynamics, training your staff, the capabilities, the know-how about businesses, monitoring as the case should be. All that is said and good, unless we have the, the someone, the, the, the box to the bottom, more to the left, or left, we, what we have mental, we call it mental orientation, better known as change management. Okay, I think Mr. Brown was alluding to that in terms of the leaders of the movement. Unless we come to the to the to the to the realization that here what we got to change to do something different, nothing will happen. Okay, so to me, there's a process of reorienting the leaders or the members or your staff or what have you to know that we have to take a different course. And if you have to take a different course, there are certain things that we have to do. Okay, so I call that the mental transition. So that, um, you know, 
we can really um, start the whole process of providing entrepreneurial support, providing finances to grow our membership, and of course, to add value, all right? And together with the other ingredients that you know, one can look at. So these are just some, I know there are, there are much more, but at the same time, you know, we need to look at that. So the big question now, how do we go about the process in terms of you know, business entrepreneurship? What is the journey that your member should go through at the end of the day? Maybe I could lend some perspective on my journey. It was not hard. It was very, no, sorry, it, it was hard. I, I almost say it wasn't hard. It was definitely hard and challenging. But of course, you know, maybe perseverance, you know, you can, you know, move forward. So, you know, we want to kind of look at that to a, a certain extent. Um, but I, I strongly believe that entrepreneurship is satisfying a need through your value proposition. Okay, so entrepreneurship is satisfying a need through your value proposition. A lot of your members can add value to the economic space in Trinidad and by extension, well, the world because of technology, you know, you can do anything, anytime, anywhere, okay? Um, but we need to, as I said, identify those targets, um, develop your members into entrepreneurs, business owners. They too will then have what we call generalizationalized form because when they get old, the children take it over, then the grandchildren, as the case would be. So there's connectivity with a whole generation within the movement or within your credit union, okay? So that we just got to do it. As I said, you're not going to get retrenched or get laid off or get fired and stay home. You've got to come back into society in a productive way. So I, I believe that um, the credit union can help. So just looking at my, my journey a bit, um, our journey started, let's say 11, 12 years ago. Um, and like everything else, you know, you can't start big, you gotta start small, right? You just can't go out there, you know? Um, so our journey started off with really one product and that was just the domestic market. And that one product was, well, anti-money laundering. You know, we started to have the new laws in 2010, 11. So all financial organizations used to do that. At, at that point in time, I was a CEO of one of the longest standing um, mortgage companies in Trinidad, over 130 years old. Um, and of course, we too needed to be involved in terms of you know, complying with the AML laws. So that is how the idea came about, to let's do that. And then from my lecturing facilitation days, I said, well, here, what well, I could capitalize that and you know, train people, I don't know, on anti-money laundering or right compliance program. So it was an idea that I believe there was a need and I believe there was a value in it for me and of course, clients, okay? So it started off like that. But of course, over the years, we have transitioned into product lines. So no longer we have one product, we have product lines, okay? So reason why I'm, I'm, I'm going through the journey because um, your members have to go through the same journey. They don't have to take the length of time because of you know, everything being done faster now. But at the same token, you, know, you can start up something, you know, be good at it, and then, you know, gradually or incrementally, you know, you move on. So, you know, we go on, you know, international, we have clients, you know, as it case to be. So if you go on our website, you know, you see the different product lines and each product line will have certain well, products and services that we offer, but it just didn't come like that. During that transition, of course, you need investment. So where do we get investment? Maybe from the banks, maybe from the credit unions, you know, but the credit unions, I, I say, got to be a bit more, um, you know, forceful and going out there and seeking business from the members who are entrepreneurs, who are business people, who have an idea and who want to expand. So you find that we would have, you know, networked with a number of key stakeholders within our financial system so that they can associate themselves with us, I don't know, based upon our reputation, our credibility. So having a business also speak to credibility and people want to associate with them, themselves with you. It also looks at branding as well. So, you know, we, we, we did all of that, you know, as a business. And of, as I said, we sort of tran transition from individuals in terms of being connected to us by just coming on our platform, as the case would be, to institutions in Trinidad and Tobago and even abroad. Okay, so that um, that part too is part of the journey. You know, you want to associate yourself with reputable people and of course, reputable um, organizations, right? To really make that journey. And, you know, it is hard work, but, you know, it is quite possible to do it. But 
I guess if you have that support from the credit union movement, I think it will be much more easier and it will be a win-win situation, both from the credit union's um, standpoint and of course the entrepreneurs, the, the individuals. So we need to kind of look at that. You know, this year we went total um, Caribbean in terms of our conference, which we normally would have in Trinidad. We just went total Caribbean. Again, COVID has sort of fast-tracked our change, we already we always had the change, but COVID just fast tracked it. And I guess we in the movement, we also have to fast track our change as well. Because, you know, your competition in Trinidad is not the 127 or the banks or the insurance. The competition, as Mr. Brown says, is your phone. And that supplier of your product, meaning alone, could be in China, could be in, in, in India, could be in Mexico, could be in the US. You know, so we got to, you know, look at that to really, um, you know, make that transition. I just want to spend a few minutes because I know time is, is, is running out. Um, in terms of some of the entrepreneurial realities, in terms of the journey of becoming financial resilience, right? Financial resilience, the journey, you know? And, and I guess, as I said, I see it as a partnership. I see it as an, an alliance between the credit unions and their members the people who desire us of forming a business or who are in business or who have a business that are not members of the credit union, we can bring those people in as members, okay? Because at the bottom line, when we look at the understanding of money and the parity of money, a dollar is a dollar. Whether you lend that dollar to a member or you lend that dollar to a businessman, a dollar is a dollar, right? And you need a return in it, okay? So you lend a dollar and they pay you back 125 Dollars, you make $25 in terms of adding value. Whether that $25 comes from an individual member who is working with a pay slip or a businessman who depends upon profit to pay you back, a dollar is a dollar. All right, so I will not go through all of these scenarios, but I'll just pick out a couple. As I mentioned before, a key aspect of making a journey is networking. So we've got to understand the power of networking because at the end of the day, we need people to buy into our vision, to buy into um, our offerings. We need to look at our suppliers of products. We need to look at the end result in terms of the, um, the consumers of our products. Another area I want to touch on is what we call leveraging. Okay, leveraging. And leveraging to me speaks to what you have already, can you do more with it? So you don't necessarily have to make investment to do more. And I say that in the context of, you know, we all, 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 already had our organization, had our license from Cisco and WebEx and so forth. And we do, you know, online training, whether it's Trinidad or Grenada, right in or Jamaica, right in Trinidad. And we leverage our, our existing platform with some customization to now host virtual meetings, okay? So yes, you may have to make some, a small investment, but not much. And a lot of our members now have talent have resources, have know-how, have capabilities, have access to land, and they can go into agriculture as the case to be. So that is really called leveraging, you know, as the case to be. If we move on to, I think I have another um, slide. Um, the businesses in terms of pricing, we are operating in a highly competitive market. So your pricing is always something that you need to look out for because you do not want to underprice, and of course you do not want to overprice, but you want to be in the game. So the pricing for a business is a key strategy. And it's the same thing for a credit union as well. How do we price our loans, our interest rates? You know, I know this is, is competitive. I know the banks are looking at us, what we are doing. And so too a business has to look at the competitors and what they are doing and see you know, if I can be competitive. At the end of the day, you got to um, sell your products. So I guess some sort of marketing must take place whether you rely on referrals, whether you rely on Facebook, social media, website, you know, um, salespeople paying them a commission as the case would be, you know, you've got to look at, 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 at those type of things in terms of marketing. Product development, I think is also key because customers taste, fashion, preferences are changing. So as we go through that journey to be financially resilient, I guess we need to develop new ideas, new products, new services as the case would be. Um, you got to know the timing of, of the rollout. You got to know your target market. Um, you got to know how you're going to package it. Um, you got to know how you're going to measure performance as it case to be. You know, 
I, but so in other words, the world is not standing still. Okay, technology on the other hand has allowed us to really fast track the 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 conceptualization and the implementation of a product or a service. Okay, so entrepreneurs, you know, have to be involved in that. We try to do it to, to the best of our ability, and so to the credit union as well. All right, so these are just some of the ideas that we have to look at. Another set of realities that we can look at too is, of course, the use of technology. I guess that goes without saying. Um, there's a, a view that you've got to pay yourself um, in terms of business. And I, I just want to tell the, the entrepreneurs or the budding entrepreneurs out there, that's a myth. Okay, that's a myth. You can't pay yourself because you have no money, especially when you start a business. So maybe that is why the failure of businesses are so high. You know, oh, pay yourself. So you now start off, you get some money, maybe a sale or two, and you pay yourself. No, you can't pay yourself, right? You've got to invest that money or maybe pay all your, if you have employees or expenses, because there is no money to pay yourself. So I, I, I told someone, you're going to pay yourself. What are you going to pay yourself with? You got to pay yourself with money, but you don't have money in terms of leveraging, in terms of volume, in terms of sales, as the case should be. Pay yourself would come after two, three years, if you're lucky, you know, that type of stuff, right? So that um, don't get carried away with paying yourself, the business will crash. <laughs> you understand? Um, you've got to sort of see about the infrastructure, look at product development, look at goodwill, look at relationship, look at networking, look at pricing, look at strategy, look at mobilizing people to buy into your vision, have that belief in yourself and you move on, right? So these are what we call the entrepreneurial realities. There are so much more in terms of lessons um, to be learned, but at the same token, um, you know, I think it's a good venture. I think whether we like it or not, that is where the world is going in terms of um, our economy now, our GDP will be highly conditional on, our, on the SME sector. And I know government, even in the budget now that has been read, a few weeks ago, really pushing the SME sector because I guess that the, world, the, the way the world is going, so people to be um, have that financial you know health, um, to be resilient, to be satisfied in terms of um, what they can do, as opposed to relying on state support, you know, as the case should be. So we have a lot of of issues. Um, financial resilience also speak to overcoming hurdles. And there are a lot of hurdles to overcome. You gotta fall, you gotta get back up. Okay. And you know, there's a saying, you know, when you fall, try to fall on your back so at least you can still see your vision so that you can get back up and be empowered to move on, to be successful, to be financially independent, to, to be generous, to, to help people, you know. You can only help people with money. So I know that um, we in the movement, of course, we are not for profit, but for service. But whether you call, if you, if you have a surplus of 100 million, or if you have a profit of 100 million, it is still 100 million. So however you call it, it is money that you can use to help people, okay? And that is where the added value proposition comes in. The bottom line for the credit unions um, and for entrepreneurs is that there will be circumstances. Since I born, there, there, there were circumstances. 10 years ago, there were circumstances. Five years ago, there were circumstances. 30 years ago, there were circumstances, okay? In 2025, there will be circumstances, okay? But the issue in terms of our financial resilience is not conditional on the circumstances. It is conditional on decisions that we make, okay? So be a product of our decision notwithstanding or irrespective of the circumstances. And it's the same thing for the credit union movement. Again, I just want to piggyback on what uh, Mariano had said. Um, you know, why the credit union only control 10% of the market, whereas we control more than half of the population, okay? Is it because of circumstances or why our members allow any banks to make billions because the, the, the billions that the banks make are not from people, from Mars or aliens, they make it from the credit union members, right? Um, they, they make their billions from, from us because I'm a credit union member as well, you know? So that um, maybe we look at circumstances why we can't do this, we have no law, we have no regulation, we fight in it for one reason or the other, as the case should be, as opposed to the decision that we have to make, whether collectively 
or whether you know taking the plunge and move out there in terms of a daring way um, to create that change to be an influencer and really add value to the movement, add value to your membership, and expand. You know the the, the, the sky's limit. And you know we in the movement, as I said, you know I think I can speak on to this too. To me, we tend to to settle for less because of credit union, the small man, the this and the that, you know? But I guess um, we have the capacity to be great within the movement. We have the capacity to be the main driver or the influencer within our credit union sector in Trinidad and of course the, the, the Caribbean as well. So we don't have to settle for less. We don't have to play small. Small is really a mindset. So if you got to put the infrastructure in place, we got to change our mindset. And that is what we talk about the mental orientation. For some of us, it would be a reorientation to know that here what? We got to change course. Because if we don't make that turn, we might go over the precipice. All right? So we got to change course. We got to um, move on and um, maybe do things differently as the case to be. And as one of our Calypsonians, um, Tambo, the journey now starts, <laughs> right? The journey now start, but um, I don't think there will ever be an end, okay? Because it's infinite and we just got to make our moves in terms of um, being, um, you know, building that financial health for a brighter tomorrow. And we can do that through entrepreneurs, okay? And I guess entrepreneurs meaning business loans and taking the risk, understanding the risk, and add value in the process. You're going to make some losses as you go along. That's, 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 that's a given, but you should make more pluses than, um, than minuses or losses. So thank you very much, um, Colin, for thank inviting you, me. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. The is yours. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much yeah. for passing you back. I think we've successfully evaded all hurdles. And if not, we're landing on our back and keeping forward with our vision. Thanks so much. Um, I mean, we, we're looking at the time and I really want to get in some questions because I have some questions both for you and for Candice. You know, I'm um, speaking yesterday, Candice spoke about, you know, um, we were speaking yesterday and she spoke about credit unions really about profit for purpose. Candice, you see? Uh, yeah, uh, in addition to a teacher, I'm also a good, a good um, student. <laughs> so that profit for purpose and building on that, before I get to Candice, I, I want to ask Nigel, in terms of, you know, people really look at, at the, the risk associated with business financing for entrepreneurs, you know, although it, it is something that could yield high rewards, it's also very high risk. So therefore, how would you recommend or what would you recommend um, especially the smaller credit unions undertaking in terms of working with their members to develop them as entrepreneurs and move them into business. Okay, what, what, what I would recommend even, and you, you may have mentioned of a, of a small credit union is mm -hmm. to understand that here what, if we continue on the present trajectory um, where credit is low, members not borrowing, you will not make money. Okay, so you got to take some risks, but we're not saying taking risks, we're talking about managing risks, because even if you lend to a salary member, that's a risk, because I am working today and I'm unemployed tomorrow, I can't pay, that's a huge risk. It's really putting the infrastructure in place, Colin, and the infrastructure in place is really understanding the, the what we call business dynamics, training yourself how to understand and to read a balance sheet, how to understand a business proposition or a plan that comes before you, how to um, help manage the person because if I have to help my members as entrepreneurs, I need to understand business dynamics, okay? So I think that is the starting block. That is really the foundation. And then you take the risk. Now, when you take the risk, you're not going to lend the member maybe 100,000. You know, incrementally you can grow. You, you, they also have to allow the member to say, hear what? I am helping you. But I cannot help you 100%. You also have to put your equity money, your sweat capital in it as well. Okay, and monitor the business in terms of the information coming back. More than likely, they're the members assign their business proceeds, whether they have a contract to the credit union, 
you have the internal signing orders taking place. But unless you, 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 you develop the capacity, right, to do it, and of course the capabilities in terms of the skills, I, I think you might be shooting yourself in the foot. Wow. That, that, that's a credit union. Excellent. Yeah. That's good. Thanks so much for that. And this now goes to Candice, because as we spoke, we're speaking about creating um, those entrepreneurs and, you know, the credit union being the example of, and I call it <laughs> competitive collaboration or competitive cooperation, because by nature, we really not, not, you know, um, not competing with another, but it's really about you know, cooperation among cooperatives and setting that example. I love the example you brought in terms of the child care cooperative and that model of business, that collaborative business, where we really provide that foundation. So leading from the question of creating entrepreneurs into committing resources to social enterprise development all right um just touch candace in terms of the importance of that for us as cooperators in terms of building that financial health and as we, we speak health your health is your wealth so you know that in your presentation was particularly interesting mm -hmm. i think it's really important too and, and going back to nigel's comments on leveraging so when you talk about in Trinidad where you have membership, you have voting public, you know, you represent so many of these individuals, um, you know, what could you do about leveraging and advocacy and networking to, um, you know, perhaps put in loan guarantee programs, perhaps loan syndication for, you know, taking, so, so mitigating that risk to, to individual credit unions balance sheets by sharing some of the risk with, with other credit unions, that's something that we've worked hard on. And um, but it does take time, and it takes it takes advocating, it takes working with government partners, and it takes bringing up that whole "what's in it for me" perspective, right? Um, so that that's a little maybe off topic of what what you asked for me, but you know we do a lot of work with um, engaging our government partners to go out and deliver uh, education seminars on social enterprise development on the difference between nonprofit and profit for purpose. And I think when, when uh, Mr. Matthew said that, when Nigel said that about nonprofits, and we spoke about it yesterday briefly, Colin, about you know, how do your members see you? If they are associating a credit union with a nonprofit, then there are perhaps connotations of that that say that you're not serious about you know, business, you're not serious about business interest, you're not serious about making money in the same way. Whereas if you re, um, you know, if you redefine what profit means, and who is the key beneficiary of that profit, that's where you start to change hearts and minds, right? So, you know, say and be unabashed about the fact that you want to make profit. But what you do with the profit is your key uh, value proposition. That's your key differentiator from your competitive, uh, your, from your banking competitors. So, you know, that that's something that only co it comes with time. And at the end of the day, I think the biggest uh, investment that that we need to make as a system, as, as a set of cooperators, as a set of credit unions, um, is really take change management seriously, because you don't change behaviors until you address that whole progression from, That's and I don't know if Nigel, if you've, in your change management experience, you've heard the phrase ADCAR? I, I heard about it, yes, yes, I heard yes. about it. So it's, it's really a shift in perspective of, you know, awareness is only really the first piece. So you have to do awareness, it's desire either. is the second stage, knowledge is the third stage, Ability is that fourth stage and reinforcement is the fifth stage. So yeah, that's correct. When you get the awareness, it always hiccups that desire because you can't make someone desire something. They have to make that decision for themselves. So what you have to do is present them with enough information for them to make an informed decision. So either they desire to change and move forward to knowledge because it's going, it's, it's for them. There's something in it for them, or 
the repercussions of not changing are harder than the pain of the change. So either way, Mm -hmm. they need to get to that point where, and that's from a leadership perspective, that's from a societal perspective, it's from a government perspective. If you show somebody what's in it for them and how the individual and the whole can benefit, you know, because you're not going to change people's hearts by just saying this is the right thing to do. Everyone knows the right thing to do, but at the end of the day, you've got a mortgage to pay. So right, it has to be that, that, that dichotomy that you have to merge those two, right? Some in some way. So um, yeah, profit for purpose, I think is a really important shift in, in, in mindset. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> no, no, well, definitely. And, and, <laughs> and more in, in Trinidad and Tobago, we call that lanyap. When you get a little lecture, <laughs> <laughs> you get a little lecture okay. back for Buck. Nigel, I, I, I don't know. I, I heard, uh, I know you touched on the, the matter of change management, and as Candice touched on it, I don't know. Yeah, you have the opportunity now to, if you want to add any anything to that, into that arena, especially for credit unions and then as member entrepreneurs as well. Well, I, I, I think Candice handled it quite nicely in terms of the approach, um, that, that ADA approach. And of course, in marketing, we have something similar called ADA, awareness, interest, desire, and action. You know, in terms of being an entrepreneur, we use that, you know. You create the awareness. You, uh, from the awareness, you transit the, the prospect into having interest into your product. And having interest now, they then have a desire, a thirst for it. And then they have an action. That is when they spend the money, you know, when they commit. So that's, that, that, that's a good approach. I think in terms of the movement going forward, she couldn't have said it better, you know, unless we come to the understanding that we need to do something different in terms of the mental, because change comes in two forms, right? The mental change, then the physical change. The mental change always precedes the physical, meaning we need to have that awareness mentally and say, yes, I want to do something differently. Um, but the, the situation or the challenge, how do we come to that process to know we need to do something differently. So that's the really hard part in terms of working with executives to let, let them see the reality of not doing it. And I think Candice mentioned something. Yes. If you don't change, this is, the, this is what's gonna happen. If yes. you change, you give yourself an opportunity to be successful, all right? And we link that to let's say like a drug addict, you know, unless the drug addict, um, I don't know, comes to the, the, the realization that I need help, I'm on drug, my I spending all my money, my family is leaving me. Unless the person come to that state, more than likely they will not change. Again, I want to piggyback on Mr. Brown's um, discourse as well. There is a, a, a challenge with you controlling the entire market in terms of members, in terms of consumers, the consumers, but less you, but but le- but you only control 10% or 5%. Something got to be wrong with that, that concept. And it speaks to whether our leaders are there mentally to make that, that change, whether our leaders want to make the change, whether our leaders believe that the change will, or the differences will just happen magically. In my view, it will not. it got to be decisive. Um, it, there got to be a plan. we got to say here what? Our sector now within the movement is 10% of the financial. Okay, next five years, let's make that to be 12%. Okay, let's make that to be 14%. That two percentage leap from 10 to 12, in monetary terms, we're looking at a couple billion dollars, okay? Oh. And we can do so much more in terms of the enhancement and development of our members with money. Whether you call it money profit or surplus, it is still money. Yeah, so it appears to be a mindset issue that is holding us back in Trinidad yes. from changing the configuration of our sector as compared yes. to Jamaica and Barbados and elsewhere. Excellent. And yeah, you touch on some very relevant points there. And to just to marry those two points, uh, earlier Candice was also speaking in terms of the role of accountability and bringing that accountability into perspective. I think that holding leaders, managers in into that position of accountability is, you know, very important. And I, th- I think also the ADCAR and the ADA is very apt for discussion. <laughs> and I, I will come up with an acronym on this. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. um, I, re- I really want to thank you all. Um, and, I mean, I just want to give each one of you 
um, both Candice and Nigel, just a minute for any closing comments before I hand the floor back over to the, ma the master of ceremonies for her to, to wrap up the morning's proceedings. So um, I'll go with Candice first, you know, just any, Nigel is just ladies first, you know, I, you I know, understand. Uh, <laughs> Chivalry <laughs> is very alive and well. So, okay. <laughs> so Candice. I thought he was just going in alphabetical order since our names are very similar. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yes. um, you know, I, I, I think that there's been some great discussion here, and I think that more opportunities to have more focused discussion because there is room in the discussion from everything from, uh, you know, uh, you know, in-depth discussion about balance sheet structuring, uh, you know, talking about your regulatory environment, talking about your need for leadership. Um, buy-in, uh, you know, membership changes, all of this forms, all of these things form very important parts of that overarching conversation that needs, needs to happen. And so, you know, mechanisms or opportunities like this where you can bring together panels, you know, so that you can have some of these open discussions. And these are some where some of the best ideas come from and the best learning comes from. So I'm just very uh, feeling very fortunate that uh, I've been included as part of this. I'm very happy that Corey wasn't able to make it. <laughs> because I was very much a, a, a second, uh, a stand-in uh, for Corey. Um, but, you know, in terms of, of merging, I think that's an important consideration to make when we're looking at consolidation. Yeah. We also have to challenge our leaders to um, really examine where they're, and I'm going to be a little maybe controversial here, but, you know, oftentimes it means displacement. Oftentimes yeah. it means that, you know, there's, there's a bit of a, um, a power restructuring that needs to happen. And, and those are tough things. You know, the what's in it for me really plays a big role. And, and, and in Canada, I don't know about there, but we often see mergers and acquisitions come into play where during key retirements of leaders. And, um, you know, that's something to look at. So maybe build in that, knowing that that is more likely to happen, build it in as, as you know, continuity planning for, you know, when you're starting to see that there are these changeovers coming in leadership, maybe that's the opportunity that's needed to look at, you know, bringing multiple credit unions together. In our case, our leaders are extremely brave and selfless in that both CEOs of the credit unions were nowhere near retirement. And, and it was done because the, 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 the thinking around it was let's do it now because we can rather than wait till later when we have to. Yes. Um, you know, and one of those leaders is actually a Trinidad and Tobago native. So Shanti Samru is, is one of the CEOs that's involved in this merger. So again, with the, the Newfoundland Trinidadian connections, I, I don't know where they come from, but they're certainly prominent. <laughs> So thank you so much for including very, me. Very welcome. So if it's not Trini by birth, I guess it'll be Trini by boots because <laughs> <you> know, <yes. laughs> we're very, yeah. very so much connected. Thanks so much, Candice, for being a part of this occasion. Nigel. Right. In terms of my, my wrap up, um, the best time to do something was yesterday. Of course, um, the second best time is now. And I think we have an opportunity to have that mindset change now. The challenge, if you look at the bigger picture in terms of GDP, we know GDP in terms of most countries have been negative, maybe except Guyana. Um, but so that tells us that the market is not growing. Okay, that tells us the market is not growing. And if the market is not growing, anyone who is growing will be growing at the expense of other people. Okay, so in other words, there'll be much more rivalry, much more competition within our financial system in, in Trinidad and, 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 and Tobago. Um, at one time in the movement, we both have been close to our members. I'm not too sure we can boast about that distinctive competence anymore. The banks have used artificial intelligence quite nicely to understand people and their needs and their wants. So you'll find that um, they will be coming after our, our, our members um, because they need to add value to their bottom line. And if they come after our members and we, we, they take well, loans from the banks with insurance, um, I think it will be at the expense of the movement because the market is not growing. If the market is growing and everybody is growing, that's fine. But that, that's going to happen, I would say, within the next two to three years. So unless the credit union's leadership, because change starts from on top, unless the credit union leadership willing to make that mindset change and get the different support and putting the infrastructure in place, I think we might be seeing a more reduction in terms of the value 
that is being added by the movement as opposed to the other sectors. So that is what I want to leave. Um, we will suffer if we don't change because the market is shrinking and they will improve at the expense of, uh, at the expense of us. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, in my, my exposure to change management, one of the statements or that always stand out with me was change the people or change the people. So, you know, I think it's, it's essential. I think we are, we are at a critical juncture for us to really embrace that change. So thanks so much to Candice and Nigel. And uh, I want to thank all, uh, all of you who sent your questions, sent your comments, and really, you know, made this, this forum what it was and even more. You know, and as Candice has alluded to, it, it lends to future discussions. And of course, I look forward to having both Candice and, my, and Nigel back <laughs> to deliver mm. some presentations. I think it's, it's an it's a opportune time. We are fortunate to have you. And on behalf of the Board of Governors and the Director of the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies, and my director, Dr. Andrew, Andrew Vincent Henry, I'd really like to thank the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service for, you know, really this collaborative approach to implementing such a wonderful webinar. We are an academic institution, and I, I think we, in addition to the academic content, we have got so much more food for thought and for direction and for purpose. Not only the profit for purpose, but presentations with a purpose. So once again, I wish all and Sanji a happy International Credit Union Day 2021 in advance. Please keep safe, God bless, and I'd like to hand the floor back over to the Master of Ceremonies, Ms. Alison Manudath. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Colin Bartholomew. But after the, all that thanks, I wonder what there, is there left for me to say. <laughs> but I would like to thank the Honorable Minister Foster Cummings for his time and his contribution to today's seminar, especially the emphasis that he played on the development of youth and rural communities. I want to thank the Permanent Secretary for his presence, Mr. Farouk Hussein, Dr. Andre Vincent Henry, who inspired us with his presentation of becoming cooperative ambassadors, Ms. Charmaine McMillan, the Acting Commissioner for Cooperative Development, for a vision for putting this webinar together. I want to thank the distinguished panelists. Mr. Mariana Brown, who I believe had to leave, and his perspective on looking at the number of statistics that we could learn from and develop in Trinidad and Tobago. For looking at those financial statistics of growth and the work that we have to do. I want to thank the international perspective from Ms. Candice Matthews which spoke from the leading edge credit union in Canada. That lovely presentation regarding the video of the daycare at leading edge credit union, which inspired us, maybe something is something that we could emulate here in Trinidad and Tobago. And her perspective with We Care programs, again, another splendid idea that we could implement here in Trinidad and Tobago but women's centers and rehabilitation. We want to thank Ms. Nigel Matthews. I believe that was the icing on the cake <laughs> for giving us that in-depth knowledge into are we really resilient as a credit union? Can our model really sustain the development in 2021 when everything is now at the touch of our fingers? on our, our telephone. Are we ready for that? All specially invited guests, all fellow corporators, members of the viewing public on Zoom and YouTube, thank you. Thank you for your participation as we continue to see your development in future seminars.
such as this. Thank you. Great stuff.